welcome to Ariel Helwani's MMA Show! Back in your life on this Monday, February 24th, 2020. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. What happened to my music there? I like the music at the top. There it is. I enjoy the music. It gets me going as we start the show. It's great to be here with all of you on this Monday afternoon. Another beautiful Monday. An unseasonably warm Monday afternoon here in New England. We're in Bristol, Connecticut, and we got a lot to discuss. Remember last week when I was talking to you all about the weekend to come, and I said this is shaping up to be a phenomenal weekend for combat sports. Guess what? I think it turned out even better than we all expected. I was in Oklahoma City doing NBA sidelines, and I had a blast working with Doris Burke, the legend, Ryan Rucco. We talked a little bit about some boxing on the broadcast. It was a great time. And then I came back home on Saturday and was watching UFC Auckland and, of course, the great boxing match Saturday night in Las Vegas. A phenomenal night for combat sports. And, of course, in our world, the big story, Paul Felder, Dan Hooker, An amazing main event. This was a fight that when it was first announced around two and a half or so months ago, we all thought there's no way that this fight is going to be bad. Like there's no chance that this fight doesn't live up to our own expectations. And dare I say, it exceeded our expectations. Now it was very close. Again, much like the Dominic Reyes, John Jones fight, it was not a robbery. It was just a really close fight. And in the end... The judges scored it in favor of the hometown guy, Auckland's guy, Dan Hooker. Now, I had it three rounds to two for Paul Felder. Very close. And I hope that the takedowns in the fifth round, because I thought John Gooden did a great job of explaining, finally, takedowns don't matter if you don't do anything with the takedown. And so I hope that that wasn't the deciding factor. Of course, it's almost impossible to know what the deciding factors are in a fight as far as the judges are concerned because the judges don't speak to us afterwards. But in the end, Felder wins, excuse me, Felder loses a very close one to Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker takes another step. I mean, there's really, you hate the fact that there's any sort of belly aching afterwards because both fight, both fighters fought with so much heart. They were so impressive, so tough, back and forth. The shots that they threw, the shots that they landed, the shots that they absorbed, just... Everything that's great about MMA was on display in this particular fight. I mean, some of these shots. And then it appeared midway through the fight that Paul Felder could not open his right eye. Or at the very least, it was en route to being permanently shut um, as far as that fight is concerned. Uh, In fact, I checked in with him yesterday as you take a look at some of the stats from this fight. As you can see, very close. I mean, look at the strikes attempted. Look at the strikes landed. 133 to 119. Significant strike. I mean, supremely close. Um, And I would say that Hooker did a little more with the takedown than, say, John Jones did in that fight. But this is a fight that could have gone either way. So I checked in with Paul Felder afterwards. There's a great photo of both of them lying on the gurney as they're being uh, taken to the hospital. They didn't meet with the press afterwards. And this is one of the best byproducts of these great fights, especially when you're dealing with two class acts. Uh, You get these photos. We've seen it time and again, most famously with the likes of John Jones and Alexander Gustafson, also Shogun Hua and Dan Henderson. So we got this photo of the two of them sitting side by side. I hope that you have seen it by now because it's just great stuff. And it shows just how great, you know, of a spirit they both have. Um, And I loved what Dan Hooker had to say about, you know, at the end of the day, we're just two dads trying to put some bread on the table. After the fight, Paul Felder said that uh, he, uh, you know, he is considering retiring. He got very emotional, uh, talked about how it's very hard to be away from his daughter, who he's very close with and very proud of uh, for these training camps. He lives in Philly, trains in Milwaukee with Rufus Sport. This is one of those situations where in the moment, uh, you know, you could be very emotional. We'll see what happens in a few months. Of course, he's turned into one of the best analysts in the game as well. Um, And so we'll see how, and look at that mouthpiece right over there for his daughter. That's just great stuff. So we'll see what happens. I checked with him a little bit. Uh, He was beat up. He's still in the hospital last I checked when I spoke to him late last night in Auckland. And, uh, you know, I, I didn't want to ask him to come on the show. He sent me this photo that you're looking at right now. You can see the right eye. Uh, as you can see, it is very much shut. And uh, he said on 
on Instagram that his face was broken. Uh, didn't get into the injuries, uh, but did make a nice little joke that he uh, said he he feels like he's looking like Action Bronson, our good friend, Bam Bam Baklava himself. And I know Action appreciated that shout out and and uh, invited him uh, to do a show with him. So it seems like Paul Felder is, uh, you know, taking this all in stride and, and is in good spirits. And so we'll see if he returns and we'll see what happens to Dan Hooker from now. Afterwards, he uh, mentioned that he'd like to fight Justin Gaethje. Not sure if the timing is going to work out on that one. Uh, as I reported last week on ESPN.com, uh, Gaethje, the front runner for Conor McGregor, it came down uh, as of right now to a two horse race, I would say between uh, Gaethje and Nathan Diaz. I, I don't see anyone else in that race right now. And Dustin Poirier doesn't seem to figure in it. I know he was talking about fighting Conor McGregor uh, last week on the show, but I would say as of right this moment, a summertime fight uh, between Gaethje and, and Conor is, is the current front runner. Things can change. Talks very preliminary at this point, but that's the fight that Gaethje obviously wants. And I think for everyone involved on Conor's side, they recognize that this is the fight that makes the most amount of sense next following what he did against Donald Cerrone and hopefully um, on the road to Khabib Nurmagomedov for them. So I'm not sure if Hooker is going to get his wish, but I appreciate the call out. I appreciate what he said. And most importantly, I appreciate the fact that he has come a very long way. This is a man who not that long ago was outclassed by Edson Barbosa. Remember that fight in Milwaukee? I mean, there was talks afterwards that they 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 should have thrown in the towel um, and that he was just not on the level of the likes of Edson Barbosa. And since then, he's won three in a row and has looked really good and has looked on point. And again, uh, another great night for the city kickboxing squad. They go three and oh, um, the 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 team continues to to be on point and it's great timing leading up to the Israel Desanya fight in less than two weeks in Las Vegas. Brad Riddell wins, Kaikara France wins, and of course, in the main event, Dan Hooker wins as well. So they leave 3-0. And I think in the history of the UFC Auckland events, there's been three now. The uh, the New Zealand fighters are 7-1. and one, So pretty impressive when fighting on their home turf. The other notable fight on that card, uh, Jimmy Crute winning in the co-main event and uh, bouncing back very nicely from his first pro loss against Misha Serkinov, looking really strong in that victory over Mikhail Oleg Shekshuk. You're looking at some of the other results over here. How about uh, Angela Hill winning once again? Kaikar France looked really good in his bounce back fight from the loss back in December. Jake Matthews with a solid win as well. Those are the prelim results. And then, of course, on the main card, you had the Dan Hooker victory. Jimmy Crude, as I said. Karolina Kovacevic suffering a tough loss. This might be the end of the road for her um, in the UFC. Just doesn't look to be UFC caliber. Her eye was messed up. I thought the, the fight should have been stopped in the second round. It looked like she was covering her eye with her hand while fighting. That's just not safe. That's not intelligently defending yourself. Not safe at all. Not smart. And uh, I don't know why they let her continue to fight. And we'll get to that kind of decision making in a second. But a fun, a fun card in Auckland. And now we turn our attention to Norfolk, Virginia. It's going to be the UFC flyweight uh, title fight that headlines that card on Saturday on ESPN+. Plus. Joseph Benavidez trying to win his first UFC title. 0-3 in title fights. WEC 0-1, 0-2 in the UFC going up against Davidson Figueredo. That's the main event. But the biggest story as far as combat sports is concerned, Tyson Fury defeating Deontay Wilder via seventh round TKO. What a victory. What a performance. What a showing from Tyson Fury. And I was genuinely surprised, genuinely surprised, dare I say shocked, that so many people were picking Deontay Wilder to win this fight. And look, I'm not going to Monday morning quarterback. As you know, as you know, when it comes to MMA, I have... Stopped making predictions. I made this rule a very long time ago. I will not make predictions anymore as far as MMA is concerned because the fighters get very sensitive. They get mad at me. They don't want to talk to me. And at the end of the day, my job at the end of the day is not to make predictions for all of you. It's to get you interviews and, and, and information from these fighters. And so what was the point? Nothing good was coming of it. So I just said to myself, I'm going to stop. But it comes to boxing... Although I do feel like we're making some headway. I feel like I've said, I feel like we need to drop the MMA from this title and just call it Ari Helwani's show because we're making some news in the boxing world as well. I felt like it was okay to make a boxing prediction because I don't really cover boxing, even though I love it, as I've told you time and again, love the sweet science, love boxing, but I don't cover it, so I felt comfortable. ESPN asked several luminaries, Stephen A., Jalen Rose, Bomani Jones, Kendrick Perkins, 
Jacoby. Asked all these people. Molly Care. Asked all these people to make predictions for the fight on Saturday. Not one of them. Not one of them picked Tyson Fury. And then when I put out my prediction, I was like, you're an idiot. You know nothing about boxing. Stick to MMA. First of all, Tyson Fury won the first fight. He won the first fight. He got jobbed by the referees just because he got knocked down in the 12th. Didn't mean he didn't win the first fight. All right, split draw. Now you want to come into the second fight, and you're going to say that Deontay Wilder has the great equalizer. He's got the eraser. He's got the right hand. Oh, he's coming in heavier now. He's going to have so much more power. Ooh, uh, Tyson Fury, 273. Oh, my God, what a big mistake that is. He's out of shape. He didn't take it seriously. He dropped his trainer, Ben Davison. What? You're doing so well and you're dropping your trainer before this fight? Sure, you're going with the Kronk Gym, Sugar Hill Stewart. Yes, great. But what are you doing? Why all these changes? Oh, 47 stitches in your last fight and you're not bringing the same cut man? Sure, Stitch Duran. He's a legend. But what are you doing? You're going to get cut once with that right and it's going to be all she wrote. And everyone was saying this. And I couldn't believe it. I was at the NBA game. People were asking me, really? You're picking Tyson Fury? Look, at the end of the day... And these kinds of matchups always bet on the boxer, not the, the puncher, not the brawler. I say this with the utmost respect for MMA heavyweights, but Deontay Wilder reminds me a lot more of an MMA heavyweight than a boxing heavyweight. He can be wild. He can be reckless. He can swing for the fences. He can rely on that right hand a little too much with those looping punches coming in there. And when you take that away from him, when you take the fight to him, when you make him fight going backwards, when you attack his body, when, you, when, you, when you, you bring jabs and head movement and foot movement, when you box him, he will be in trouble. And that's exactly what happened on Saturday. It was never in doubt. I don't think Tyson Fury lost a single round. I saw some people, I think, giving the second or third to Deontay Wilder. He did not lose a single round. Seven rounds to none. And in the end, in the seventh round, Mark Breland, who's... One of Deontay Wilder's uh, trainers, his co-trainer, to be exact, threw in the towel. Now, afterwards, Deontay Wilder said, I wish they didn't do that. I wish they let me go out on my shield. I respect him for saying that. I expect nothing less from fighters in those situations. They're all going to say that. No one wants to have the, th the, the towel thrown in on them. No one wants the fight to stop. They want to be knocked out. And that's cool. And that's why we love them because they have that spirit because they, they possess that spirit that we can never dream of. But Mark Breland should be celebrated today. He saved him from further damage. Nothing was going to happen to change that fight. The great equalizer had been equalized. The eraser was erased. Nothing was going to happen to change that fight. Tyson Fury was going to win 12 rounds to none. So I picked Tyson Fury. I picked him to win via decision. That was an underdog pick. Fury via KO or TKO was a plus 450. I didn't go out on those kinds of limbs because I didn't think that he'd be able to finish him and equalize him like that. Holy smokes, what a performance. What a moment. I love the fact that Breland stopped the fight. I love the fact that he said, let's lift the fight another day. I wish this sort of thing would happen more often in MMA. There's nothing wrong with this. You have to save the fighters from themselves. Again, as I was saying, why did Karolina Kovacevic continue to fight on Saturday as she is covering her eye with her glove? What good is going to come of that? Is she really going to knock out anyone doing that? Absolutely not. Stop the fight. Now, again, a theory of mine is show money, win money, half, half. You only get paid half if you don't. If you don't win in boxing, it's a lot different. So, and of course, these guys are making a hell of a lot more money. I get it. But we need to start thinking past that. And I would also argue we need to start changing the model. But that's a bigger discussion for a bigger day. Start protecting the fighters. It's okay to stop the fight. And again, we saw this on Saturday. I thought that was a great moment. I thought Tyson Fury afterwards was very gracious in victory. Wilder, I know he talked about some of the, the, the injuries and, you know, uh, quote unquote excuses let the man have his moment he was just roughed up there was some talk that maybe he busted his eardrum in the end it seems to come out that he just had a cut in there but he was roughed up big time and so now the big question is he has 30 days to invoke his rematch clause this is a lot of fun this is the kind of stuff we don't get in MMA I love all this stuff this drama is he going to invoke the rematch clause or does he go another direction try to build himself back up and in the meantime does Tyson Fury fight someone else now, the fight to make 
is Anthony Joshua. That would be one of the biggest fights in boxing history and certainly the biggest fight in British boxing history. Take that fight to England, put it in a football stadium, Wembley, Spurs, whatever, and sell 100,000 tickets. Easy. In one day. No problem. I mean, just look at those two guys. And I know that Joshua lost to Andy Ruiz back in June. Doesn't matter. I thought he looked phenomenal in the rematch in Saudi Arabia, and it's still a great fight. It's still a fight that I think we all would want to see. Now, he's scheduled to meet Kerbet Pulev, uh, who, by the way, is the guy, I don't know if you know the heavyweight who kissed the reporter. That guy's great as well, and there's some talk of that fight happening in June, but I say scrap that. Pulev is, is promoted by Bob Arum and Top Rank. Just tell him to take a seat for a second like they asked Carlos Condit to take a seat way back when and make that fight. That's the fight. Use this momentum. The best part of Saturday was that it was a victory for boxing. It was a great night for boxing. Everyone wants to hate on boxing. Boxing is dead. Combat sports. Uh, never lives up to the hype. Boxing. Oh, uh, we pay $75. Never lives up to the hype. Mayweather Pack. This fight was great. If you bought this fight, it lived up to the hype and you got your money's worth. And it was so fascinating from a business perspective to see both Fox and ESPN coming together promoting this fight. Never seen that before with HBO and Showtime. Every single channel was talking about this related to those two networks. Every single FS1, FS2, ESPN, ESPN News, ESPN. It was like wall to wall coverage. They were out there. It felt big. Boxing deserves these kinds of moments. And the walkouts were grandiose. The pomp and circumstance. It was so much fun. This is what boxing is all about. This is why I love it. I get so mad when people say, oh, you cover MMA? That's a good thing. It's a good thing you cover MMA because boxing is dead. Boxing isn't dead. Boxing is doing great. It's kill you see that gate? 17 million? Boxing is killing it these days. Boxing is on fire. Boxing is so much fun and there's great characters and you got a guy like Tyson Fury as a heavyweight leading the charge now as the lineal heavyweight champion. I mean, he is... He's a superstar. What a story. 2017, he's 400 pounds jogging around there in his big coat saying that he's coming back, can hardly breathe. And now look at what he's doing. He's in the discussion now for one of the greats as far as heavyweight boxing is concerned. I mean, this is just magical stuff. It was a great night for boxing. It was so exciting to be there uh, at home watching it. I wish I was in Las Vegas. I wish I was there. I wish I was able to take that all in. But I was really, really pleased to see what Tyson Fury did. And again, I could not believe that no one picked him. I mean, I, I, okay, sorry, I'll take that back. Uh, it seemed like the majority of the people were going for Deontay Wilder, and I couldn't believe it. Tyson Fury is a phenomenal boxer, phenomenal. And uh, if you look at the two of them on paper as far as their skills, Deontay Wilder is just not on his level. So I hope he goes, fights someone else, builds himself back up, and then we'll get the trilogy fight. I think it would be a big mistake to go back in there. Big mistake. He was outclassed. Absolutely outclassed. So anyway, uh, that was a lot of fun. We're going to be talking a lot about that. We're going to be talking UFC, of course. I hope I don't go too crazy on the boxing stuff here. I, I would I would do a boxing show if they let me, to be honest. I love boxing, uh, but I know the audience. I just feel like this particular fight transcends all sports. And again, like I said last week, if you're an MMA fan and... And, and, and you're not like the biggest boxing fan, because I understand it's hard to, to, to follow it. It can be a little bit disjointed. It gets a little confusing with the promoters and the networks and the, the, the clauses and all this stuff, the contracts. But anyone who's a sports fan, and if you are especially an MMA fan, how could you not have been captivated by that scene on Saturday? And there's a part of me that wishes, like, can we, I'm not saying for all the fights, but for some of the big fights, look at how we reacted to Israel Desanya's victory. Look at that, like that, 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 that walkout and what he did afterwards. And that was nothing compared to what we saw on Saturday, right? Look at that. Let the guys show off their personalities a little bit. That was great stuff. All right, here's today's lineup. And then uh, we'll get rolling today. There's Brad Riddell. He had a big victory on uh, Saturday in Auckland against Magomed Mustafaev. Another hard-fought split decision victory, as I said. Uh, he is a member of City Kickboxing. And a great story from him. Uh, someone sent me this on Instagram. He was uh, up at 5 a.m. the next day training students. He's a coach as well at City Kickboxing. Up at 5 a.m. the next day after his fight. Now, it was an afternoon fight, sure, but still. I mean, you talk about a mensch move right over there from Brad Riddell. And so cool to see uh, Izzy and Volkanovsky, all the guys in the uh, front row cheering on their guys. Another one of those guys, Dan Hooker, as I said, will also be on the program at 3.30 to talk about uh, the big victory on Saturday over Paul Felder and where he goes from here. We'll talk to Jimmy Crute about his big win, bounce back win. Got a, another Kimura, uh, his second Kimura in the UFC and now one of five UFC 
see fighters to have two Kimuras inside the octagon. No one has ever had three. James Gallagher will join us, talk about his upcoming fight against Cal Elnor and also why he was unable to fight on this weekend's Bellator Dublin card. Bellator had two events this weekend. So again, it was a really busy weekend for combat sports. Uh, they had one in uh, Thackerville and one in Dublin. Ryan Hall has been itching for a fight. We'll catch up with him, get his thoughts on what is next for him. Joanne Calderwood is going to be fighting uh, against Valentina Shevchenko for the UFC Women's Flyweight title on June 6th. UFC 251, I do believe. Uh, location TBD, but everyone suspects that it will be Australia. So we'll talk to her about getting that title fight. Joanna Jacek is getting ready for her title fight in less than two weeks in Las Vegas against Zhang Weili. And great to hear that uh, Zhang is in Las Vegas. She was able to uh, have the proper time uh, to get quarantined um, after the you know coronavirus outbreak in China. And she went to Abu Dhabi and now she is good to go. Steven Adams. Yes, the Steven Adams of the Oklahoma City Thunder is going to be on the program. I had a chance to catch up with him following the game on Saturday. And let me tell you, this guy is a massive fan. He was referencing interviews that I did back in 2011 with Rampage Jackson. He is a legit fan. You'll learn more about that in our chat. And we will also talk to Eddie Hearn. Yes, the Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing. I've wanted to have this man on the program for quite some time. I'm a big fan of his style. He is quite the character. I really enjoy him. And we'll get his thoughts. Of course, he is the promoter for Anthony Joshua, among many others. So we'll get his thoughts on the possibility of that fight and also what Tyson Fury did. Recall last week, Tyson Fury had some not very nice things to say about that man. So we'll talk to Eddie Hearn about that in around 20 minutes time. But first, Let's go to the phone lines and say hello to our first guest of the day. His name, well, you know him on this show. We've had him on plenty of times in the past. George Lockhart, one of the very best nutritionists in the game. And he played a huge part in what happened on Saturday night in Las Vegas. Here's Tyson Fury talking about George Lockhart and the influence that he had on him last week on the program. I'm working with George Lockhart. It's really, um, really improved my, um, the way I look. And the way I perform as well. Wow. And you know, George Lockhart, very famous in our world, worked with the likes of Connor and, and many different MMA fighters. Is this your first time working with him? First time working. It's been a fantastic experience. Um, I've never ate as much food in my life, never drunk as much water in my life. Everything's going really, really well, to be fair. George is a great guy. Okay. So this is someone that you'll continue to work with if all goes well come Saturday? 100%. All went well on Saturday. There was so much talk after Tyson Fury weighed in at 273. What is going on? Why is he so big? Let's talk to the man who was behind all of that, the great George Lockhart, kind enough to join us right now. George, how are you? Hey, what's going on, Harry? It's good, uh, good to be on the show, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's great to talk to you again, and congratulations to you and the team on the victory on Saturday. And so let me ask you, how did you get hooked up with Tyson Fury? How did this all start for you? Honestly, so I was working with Badu Jack, and um, everything went really well. And uh, one of his managers, so Frank Shea and uh, Amir Abdallah, they, uh, you know, they uh, see what I did with Badu, and, and uh, Tyson was looking for basically a food prep company. And they were like, no, 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 you need, you need a nutritionist. Um, and they basically sent, you know, sent me out there, and I think he was kind of skeptical, but uh, after everything went down, he, uh, he became a believer. Why do you think that he was skeptical initially? Uh, you know, he's, he's old school. You know, he's kind of like, you know, you eat whatever you want. You have the right mentality. If you're tough, you know, you, you drive through, you push through, um, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get the results. Um, honestly, like after the first couple of weeks, he was like, wow, I am, uh, I'm recovering a lot faster. I feel a lot better. And uh, then when he started seeing the physical differences, like, Man, I'm I'm the same weight, but I look completely different. Um, it was it, you know after that it was just kind of like a, a chain of events. You know I would wake you know every morning he wake up I would tell him what weight he was gonna be. be like hey tomorrow you're gonna be this weight tomorrow you're gonna be this weight. He's like holy crap you're like right on the money. Huh. Uh, we had, we had a running joke because he wanted to be a specific weight uh, the day of the fight, and uh, he woke up he's like George. <laughs> I wasn't that weight. And I was basically, I was 0.4 out or off. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And he, he's like, George, yeah, yeah. I, he was, he was joking with me. He's like, George, uh, you went right. You know? And I was like, Oh, come on, man. I'm like, drink some water. Cause I was, I was basically uh point four under, but, uh, no, it went really well. And, uh, it, it was an honor to work with him. The guy and the team were awesome. And, and so did you live with him? Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 well, I lived in the house right behind him. So, okay. you know, um, I was there from the moment he woke up to the moment he went to bed and, uh, man, he was awesome. He was, uh, it was an adventure, I guess. This was the biggest camp that I've ever been a part of. And when I say the biggest camp, I mean, not necessarily the amount of people or anything like that, but the size of them. Ariel, okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> dude, like usually I'm, I mean, I'm 230 pounds. So I'm like the big guy. Uh, in his camp, I was a munchkin. I was like a man baby walking around, man. I was like, oh my God. Like his brother is bigger than he is. And he's six, nine, 200. You know, when I showed up, he was 275 pounds. Um, I was like, wow, I've never felt so small in my life. Do you recall how much he weighed when you first started working with him? Yeah, he was, he was two, uh, 275 when I first started working with him. Oh, wow. Okay. So n- nothing really changed as far as how much he weighed in the end, but a lot changed, right? Oh, 100%. So, you know, we actually went down to 260 pounds. It was like there was a couple of things that, that, that uh, changed over the course of the camp. Like uh, he went down to 260, and then, uh, I, you know, I talked to uh, Sugar Hill, and I you know, communicated with him quite a bit. And I was like, you know, how's he doing? He's like, you know, this is the way that he needs to be. Uh, this is what I saw him, you know, sparring uh, at his best. I'm like, done deal. Then I talked to Tyson. I'm like, when did you feel your best? Um, and then it, it, it was funny because the weight kept changing, like uh, basically like, okay, I want to be this way. Then I want to be this way. We kind of honed in on it. And then obviously the day of the fight, he was exactly where he wanted to be, where the coach wanted him to be. And, um, and then he went out and performed. <laughs> Are you able to tell us how much he weighed on Saturday night? Yeah, so Saturday night he was about two hundred. I mean, <laughs> this is funny. He's about two hundred. He was exactly what he started out with uh, when we started working. Almost exactly. Um, what was that? Two seventy five. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> it's funny. It's like, okay, what did you actually do, George? But. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The amount of, you know, we, like I said, we went down like, uh, the first couple of weeks, um, you know, I wanted to do it very slowly. And I, you know, I, I think the first couple of weeks he, he, he wasn't frustrated, you know, he, he was, he, you know, obviously, you know, you know, Tyson, super cool guy and everything, but you tell like, he was, he'd be like, dude, I usually lose like seven pounds in a week. And, um, I, you know, I'm trying to tell him, like, if you lose, like, a lot of people don't realize when you lose weight, you actually lose more muscle than you do fat. The slower you do it, uh, the less muscle you actually lose. So he comes down every single fight. He loses every single fight. But this time it was like, okay, this time we're going to hold on to as much muscle as possible and and try and, and, uh, you know, minimize the amount of muscle loss and and maximize the amount of uh, fat loss that, that happened, you know, obviously keeping performance first. And, uh, I think, you know, I think a lot of people realized when, when he walked into the cage, like he literally was, he was bigger, but he was actually a lot leaner. See, this is how I know that you're an MMA guy at heart. You just said he, uh, when he walked into the cage, as opposed to the ring, it's hard to change those little things, right? (laughs) Bro. I'm telling you so much. Like I'm, I'm, um, we're getting into the, the boxing game and there's so many things that I say, and I'm I'm like, oh crap, my bad, bro. I'm you know, um, when we first started working with Triple G, Ariel, this is embarrassing. This is, I mean, this is so bad. Like uh, uh, when Triple Triple G called us up, and uh, you know, I called Dan, um, my business partner, and I was like, hey Dan, I'm like, dude, you know, Triple G called us up. Do you know who this guy is? Huh, what? And uh, yeah, he's like, are you fucking kidding me, George? Like, you don't know who Triple G is? And I'm like, oh, hey, go down now. You know, I'm like, oh man, dude. I'm like, oh man, I'm um, sorry, bro. Uh, you know. And then after I started working with him, I'm like, oh my god, this is embarrassing. Like he's one of the greatest boxers of all time, you know. And uh, yeah, so I'm learning slowly but surely who people are. Like after I started working with Triple G, I, you know, I watched the uh, the Anthony Joshua fight when he fought Andy Ruiz for the first time. Um, you know, they're like, no, Anthony Josh was amazing. He's, he's amazing. He's amazing. And then, and then, uh, Andy Reese beat him. And I'm like, okay, wait, you know, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm learning slowly but surely. In terms of mentality, in terms of structure, just like, you know, th there are definite things as a fan that I see that are different in terms of boxing uh, versus MMA. But as someone who's like working with these guys, do you, do you sense a difference between working with boxers and MMA fighters? Is there a big difference that, that comes to mind? No, you know, honestly, um, working with Tyson was a lot very similar to working with Connor. Um, and when I say like their, their mentality, um, it is one of those things where like, I knew he was going to win. And, and when I say, I know somebody's going to win, I'm like, oh, you know, their mindset's right. Their camp is perfect. You know, we, we both know that anything can happen on any given day in a fight, you know, anything could happen. But I'm like, there's nothing that this individual could possibly do um, to, you know, do better to win this fight. And it, it's funny because, like, a lot of people, they'll have, like, a bad day of sparring, and they're going to – they'll come back and they'll be like, my nutrition was off. George, you're like, I don't think you gave me enough carbs or this or that. And Tyson never has an excuse. Same thing with Connor. You know, it's like a lot of people try and get into the right mindset, whereas – Connor and Tyson, they don't have to get the right mindset. It's just innate in them. You know, they just constantly think that way. You know, it's, it's the craziest thing in the world. Um, you know, as a fighter myself, like I was always trying to be like, okay, you know, I got to, you know, prep myself. Like, okay, you know, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get ready for a fight. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to think this way. Whereas they just innately do that. And I saw that with Tyson and, you know, I was like, well, I'm, a lot of people, um, they're like, oh, I'm not, I don't get nervous for the fight. Almost everybody says that, you know, I, I, I hate to say this, but I mean, before my fight, I used to get nervous. I used to yeah. get nervous as hell. And, um, it, it wasn't, you know, I always said that there's a difference between scared and nervous. Nervous says like, all right, I know what I'm, I'm willing to go through to, to win this fight and it's going to suck. Um, but I, you know, I, you know, I see Tyson every time he used to spar, every time he'd go to, you know, training or anything like that. He just loves being in the in the ring. He loves it. Like he thrives on that. Same thing with Connor. You know, like Connor loved it. You know, and, and when people were watching, if people were watching me spar, I, you know, I, my 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 thought process would kind of kind of you know go away and stuff You're like that. Not? Whereas they they would they would actually do better. You know what I mean? And um, you know, that's the same thing with Tyson. You know, I remember um, a few weeks ago when you were going out to Las Vegas, you posted a picture on Instagram of your uh, your ticket, and you're like, oh, guess where I'm going? And and I think a lot of people thought, oh, you're going back to work with Conor because it was around the time of his fight, but in the end, it was with Tyson Fury. How come you did not work with Conor for this fight? Was it because you committed to Tyson beforehand? Uh, no, no, no. You know, like, obviously, I have a great relationship with Conor, and, um, you know, I, I'm very loyal to people that have been good to me, you know, um, I've, there's, there's no doubt about it that my success, a lot of it, you know, has, has dealt with Connor because of Connor's, uh, rise and stuff like that. So I'll always, anytime, you know, Connor calls me up, he's like, Hey, George, I need you. I'm there in a heartbeat. But we had a guy, uh, Tristan Kennedy, one of the guys that had went through our certification. Um, not only did he go through our certification, but the guy's actually got degrees in nutrition. He's got, you know, in, in Ireland, there's two different degrees that you can get, and he's got both of them. Um, you know, me and him have worked together for a long period of time. So he was out for, for Connor. So I knew Connor was taken care of. And, and then uh, that gave me the ability to come out and, and work with Tyson. So okay. yeah, obviously, Connor wasn't cut weight or anything like that. But if Connor goes to, you know, when Connor goes to 155 again, I'll, I'll definitely be out there for it. Okay. Um, for a guy like Tyson, as big as he is, as as athletic as he is, could you tell us, like, how many calories does he consume a day in the midst of camp? Man, honestly. So, Ariel, when I first started working with him, um, I was like, okay, how much am I going to have to feed this guy? <laughs> because you know, <laughs> it, it, it's insane. You know, when I first met him, I didn't realize the size of this guy. There's a picture that I posted on Instagram um, that I'm right next to him. I'm, again, I'm 230 pounds. I'm, I'm, I'm not a little guy. But when I took the picture next to him, I'm like, this guy is massive, man. He's humongous. <laughs> um, so I started feeding him. And, uh, you know, he, 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 he just he's not a guy that's like, hey, what am I, eat? what am I eating again? What am I eating again? He, he's not like that at all. 
Um, and it's hilarious because when I showed up, he's like, Hey, I got a guy that I'm training with that's fighting on the same card. Uh, can you help him out? I'm like, yeah. And I'm expecting another like heavyweight. And it, it was Isaac Lowe, who is, a, a fighter at the 126. Hmm. And I'm like, great. <laughs> I got a 274 guy yeah. and I got a guy at 126. <laughs> like this is, but, uh, the funny thing is, is Isaac would eat more than Tyson. Isaac's like, can I get some more? Can I get some more? You know, and uh, we used to make jokes about it. The guy's like an endless pit, whereas Tyson was, he, he didn't eat a whole lot. But, um, you know, in the beginning of camp, I had to actually include, like, tons of vegetables, tons and tons of vegetables. He doesn't like to taste the vegetables, so I'd cook it in a way where he couldn't really taste it. But a lot of the, a lot of the meals included, I mean, mostly veg, and he would still lose very slowly. But by the end of camp, Ariel, I could not feed him enough, and he'd still lose weight. I remember there was one night that I, I fed him a pound of, uh, of uh, beef. It was a, a lean beef, but it was a pound of beef. And I'm like, okay, we're, he's going he's, you know, to obviously be heavier tomorrow. And he lost like a, a pound and a half overnight. And I'm like, God almighty, like, wow. I got to get this guy – so his metabolism definitely increased over the, the course of the camp, which is a good sign, which means his, his body became more proficient at, um, you know, basically processing things. And, you know, but uh, no, it was if I've ever been in a perfect camp, that was it. You know, it's it's interesting because after the weigh-ins on Friday, you got all these people freaking out. What? 273? What's going on? He didn't take it seriously. Bet on Wilder. Bet on Wilder. Do you go back to your 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 home, wherever you're staying, the team, and even in your own thoughts on Friday and just laugh at all of this? Like all these people, talk, you, like you, you have this down to a science and everyone... And, and you were expected, like this wasn't a shock, right, for you guys. He said he wanted to come in at around that weight as well. And everyone's using what you guys consider to be success as, oh, this is the reason why he's going to lose. Like, do you just laugh at that on Friday night? Yeah, no, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I used to take a lot of stuff to heart. I still do, Ariel. Like, we, you know, people, they, you know, they say things, you know, uh, all like, what what the heck, Lockhart? Like like you came in and he's heavy. Like what what did you do? Like what is this? What is that? When you know I, you, you're up at five thirty every morning and you go to bed at ten thirty every night. Like every single day, seven days a week for eight weeks straight. It's it's a grind. You know you're working like a lot of people are like ah oh, man I had a rough week. I worked sixty hours or forty hours. Like these are a hundred and twenty hour work weeks, and you're looking and like oh man like people don't understand that the amount of energy and work that went into this and it came in perfect. Um, the problem is, is they look at that number on the scale, but when you look at it, like I wish we would have took a before and after picture, but the before at 275 and the after at 275, what we did was absolutely amazing. Like it just, his performance went up, you know, we held on to muscle, we lost body fat. And if you ask any nutritionist or dietitian or anybody that knows anything about food, it's impossible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. You're either anabolic or catabolic. And what he did during this camp is he held on to just about every ounce of muscle that he possibly could have. And he lost a, a considerable amount of body fat. And, you know, you know, I did my part, you know, my small part. Uh, for the fight, and um, you know, I was I was happy. You know, obviously watching him, it was it was a a great conclusion. I would imagine you're going to continue to work with him. Is that the plan? Absolutely. So the cool thing is, is uh, you know, everything that he did was for performance. Uh, I worked. It was funny because his brothers were out there. His brother, he has he has a brother, Huey. And he's like, George, you know, like, you know, can I lose some weight? And I'm like, all right, man, we, we talking about performance, talk about aesthetics. And he's like, yeah, I do. I, honestly, he's like, I just want to look better. <laughs> I'm like, done deal. So he was uh, 285 at the beginning of the camp. And it was funny because, like, I didn't start working with him. Like, we didn't have this conversation until about two weeks after. And the reason being is because he started seeing a difference with Tyson. And he's like, hey, George, uh, you know, can we? Uh, and I'm like, absolutely, brother. Uh, so he went from 285 to 235 by the end of camp. So that was a six week time period. And if you look at, it was funny because if you watch Chewie, his brother and the last fights, like they, they showed like uh past fight uh, clips and stuff like that. When Huey's walking out with his brother, uh, you see a massive 
difference between the physique. I, you know, I saw him I like, oh my God, it looks like a completely different person. And the same thing with his brother Shane. His brother Shane, um, I think he lost like three or four stone, which is funny to say, uh, Ariel, because you know, with Ireland, you know, I get the kilograms. <laughs> Obviously, America I get the pounds. And I showed up, and they were like, um, "I'm, you know, 18 stone." I'm like, "Goodness gracious, like, like, good, <laughs> good God, like the stone." You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, I had I had no idea, man. I it was it was it was definitely a difference of, a, uh, 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 you know, a, I guess measurement. That's amazing. Well, I'm happy for you, George. Uh, it's great to see good people doing well. And uh, I would imagine the uh, the Mike Dolce fight is off. This is not happening. In conclusion, never materialized, right? No, no, man. You know, he just you know he, he asked uh, bare knuckle boxing for for five hundred thousand dollars, which obviously he knew was not going to ever happen. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't cost a dime for me to fight that guy. You know, he's. Uh, I'll just I'll just leave it at that. You know, he is what he is, and uh, I am who I am. You know, I'll just continue to keep being successful and caring about people that I work for, and uh, he can continue about, you know, loving himself, I guess. But, um, yeah, like I said, it is what it is. All right, we will leave it at that. Congratulations to you and the team on what you guys did on Saturday. Uh, great to see you a part of his team. I, I thought that that was an amazing little connection to our world of mixed martial arts, and I'm glad to see that you're expanding into the world of boxing as well. That's 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 great to see. So thank you for the time, as always, George. And again, congrats. Thanks, brother. Hey, one one thing real quick. So, you know, everybody knows it's Lockhart and Leith. My, my, uh, my brother, Dan Leith, he just, uh, he just opened a, a gym in Livonia. Um, in Michigan, and uh, you know he's he's one of the best people I know. Obviously, my best friend. So I just want to say, anybody that's out in Livonia, uh, out by uh, Detroit or whatever like that, if they if they want to you know go to a a Gracie Baja gym, they're looking for a place to train. Make sure that they freaking look him up, man. And uh, Ariel, it's always an honor, man. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks again for everything, brother. Anytime. There he is, the great George Lockhart, uh, massively responsible for the Tyson Fury that we saw on Saturday. Great to have him on the show once again to talk about the success of that training camp. Now, before we get to our next guest, I am very excited about our next guest. I'm very excited to talk to Eddie Hearn. I've always wanted to have him on the show. Let me tell you about our good friends over at Ancestry DNA. There are many paths to finding your family story. Whichever way you choose, tracing your family generations back with a family tree or uncovering your ethnicity with Ancestry Ancestry DNA, it's easy to get started with Ancestry. Ancestry DNA can reveal ethnic origins and provide historical details that bring unique family stories to life. Ancestry DNA doesn't just tell you which countries you're from, but also can pinpoint the specific regions within them, giving you insightful geographic detail about your history. Trace the past of your recent ancestors and learn how and why your family moved from place to place around the world. No other DNA tests deliver such a unique interactive experience. It's easy to start making discoveries with Ancestry. Grab an Ancestry DNA kit and start a free trial to amplify your discoveries. Start exploring your family story today. Head to our URL at Ancestry.com slash MMA. That's Ancestry.com slash MMA to get your Ancestry DNA kit and start your free trial. That's Ancestry.com slash MMA. Again, Ancestry.com slash MMA. Support them because they support us. So like I said at the top, I've been wanting to have Eddie Hearn on this show for quite some time, but I was always waiting for the right moment. After what happened on Saturday night, in Las Vegas, and after the demand for the Anthony Joshua Tyson Fury fight, I thought, what better time than now to have the head man over at Matchroom Boxing on this program for the very first time, in my opinion, one of, if not the best combat sports promoters today. And there he is, the one and only Eddie Hearn, kind enough to join us. Eddie, how are you? I'm good, just realizing how big my head is. Yes, it is quite. Did we just make it on no context, <laughs> Hearn, right off the bat? Like in, in the exactly. first five seconds? <laughs> Oh, wow. This is great. Um, well, it's good. It's good to have you on the show, Eddie. I really appreciate it. Um, you've been doing amazing things and it's, it's great to see some fresh blood in the promotion game as well. Um, so first, let me ask you, what did you think of Tyson's performance on Saturday? I thought it was fantastic. I mean, I'd heard the stuff in the camp that he was going to try and be aggressive. He was going to come in heavy. He was going to try and go for the knockout. Basically all the things that I would advise him against, to be honest with you, against Deontay Wilder. And I thought the tactics from Tyson, from Sugar Hill, from Andy Lee were, were brilliant. You know, I thought it was a great performance. 
He absolutely battered Deontay Wilder from pillar to post. There's a few people been saying for a while, you know, the way you fight Wilder is you back him up, you, you know, you bully him. But because of his, it's not even perceived power, it is power. He, I think he gets the respect of people not really coming forward and putting the pressure on. Fury did it. He did it very effectively. And like I said, it was a complete one-sided battering. I mean, it wasn't close. There wasn't a round that he lost. And uh, it was a conclusive win and a great victory for Tyson Fury. Uh, you made some headlines before the fight saying that you had heard that the camp was in a bit of disarray. Uh, so would it be fair to say that uh, you were not expecting this Tyson Fury? And perhaps did you no, just get some, some false I, info? I didn't really say. What I said was that I'd heard things in camp that I didn't like. And what I'd heard was that Tyson Fury was going to try and put it on Deontay Wilder. He was going to try and go for the knockout. He was going to try and be aggressive. And I thought that was a terrible game plan. And it was brilliant. It was a genius game plan. And, um, you know, there was other people that I know had heard the same thing from the camp that thought it was crazy as well. But it ended up, like I said, being genius. And I guess sometimes when you break fights down and you start looking at it, maybe you start thinking, yeah, that you know, that is the thing to do against Deontay Wilder. And Wilder didn't know what to do. He was, you know, I thought, again, I thought Fury is amazing. I thought, I thought Wilder was really, really poor as well. I mean, he didn't look right from the first bell. You know, Jay Diaz come out with one of the greatest excuses of all time that the outfit that he wore on the ring walk was heavy. Never heard that one before. Uh, but to be fair to, to uh, Deontay, I didn't feel like he looked... You know, he looked heavy-legged from even before that first right hand round the side of the head, you know? Whether Fury... Fury's got this great way of kind of like mentally overwhelming you. And he almost looked like a guy, Wilder, that was done before the fight even got started. And um, Fury's really good at that. Last week on the program, we had Tyson Fury on before the fight, of course, and I asked him about your comments. I couldn't even get the question out because he interrupted me. I want to play you this clip and then get your response, okay? Yeah. Here it is. Eddie Earns a wanker. So, yeah, stop you right there. Don't care what he's got to say at all. The man's a clown. I don't, I don't care what he says, who he says. He mentions my name to keep relevant, keep his fighters relevant, which that's up to them. Um, let, let them do what they've got to do, you know. But everyone's got to live their own life and everyone's got to work their own career. So wh where's that coming from? What's the beef between you and Tyson? I don't know. It's like, it's weird because he phones me up quite a lot and he FaceTimes me and he, he called me recently, well, before this camp. I don't know, it was like midnight or one o'clock in the morning. He FaceTimed me about eight times and I was laying in bed and I thought, what is he doing? And I had to pick it up. He was texting me saying, Call me, call me ASAP, call me ASAP. And he was just asking me to meet him up for a beer. And, you know, I think uh, a lot of it is, is uh, play talk from Tyson Fury. He's actually blocked me on Twitter, which wow. is disappointing. You know, Ariel, that I met Tyson Fury in November 2018 to sign him in Monaco. And... He wanted to fight really, really low-level guys. I should have signed him. I, hands up. I should have signed him. And I looked at this guy in Monaco, and he made me look like an athlete. I mean, this guy was huge. He was 28 stone. I looked at him. I thought, I, I don't believe you're going to come back. What he has done has been incredible. Forget the Deontay Wilder victory. What he has done to even return to the professional game and to fight at that kind of level from the position that he was in, in his life, in his physical condition, it is, it is truly remarkable. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, I guess, a little bit of a love-hate with him. If I see him out, if I see him around, you know, it's all good. I think that he likes our work. I like his work. But now, when I look back and think, should I have signed him? We get to a stage where I'd rather have my man in a race and one man in a race because I wouldn't feel comfortable going into this fight and this promotion with both guys. Mm. You know? And it, AJ is a very good friend of mine. I've represented him from the day he turned pro. We're in this together to be undisputed. Last year was terrible and then wonderful, all wrapped into one. And now, three months ago, PBC and Al Heyman and America 
had complete control of the heavyweight division. Every belt, every champion. Now, little old us <laughs> over here in the good old UK have every single belt in the heavyweight division. And it's massive for us. It's massive for our country and our sport. It's never happened before. It will never happen again. And we sit on the verge of not just one of the biggest fights in British boxing history, but one of the biggest fights of all time between these two. Two British world champions. A chance for an undisputed heavyweight world champion from Great Britain. We'll see what happens. We're ready. I believe Fury will want this fight. I guess a lot of it rests on our good old friend Deontay Wilder to see what he's going to do next. Okay, so you covered a lot there. Let's talk about the facts as we know them. As you mentioned, Deontay Wilder has a rematch clause. He has 30 days to invoke that clause. So at the end of the day, if he says, I want to do it, really no one has a say, right? I mean, legally, he can do that. Um, let's just say he doesn't do it, okay? Let's say he says, you know, I want to take some time off. I want to fight someone else. I want to build myself back up. And, and I heard Frank Warren on, I think, BBC Radio this morning saying, we need to ask Eddie Hearn this question. Is Anthony Joshua going to fight Pulev in June? Because if that happens, we're not going to get the Tyson Fury fight this summer. And so the question I want to ask you is, is Pulev versus Joshua going to happen? Or is that fight not a done deal? Is Joshua waiting to see what's going to happen with Wilder and then what Tyson's decision is going to be? Well, I mean, firstly, you know, there's two people that pull the strings when it comes to Tyson Fury, Bob Arum and MTK. I've spoken to both of those guys. We want the Tyson Fury fight next. AJ called me yesterday and said, how do we make this fight happen? We have a mandatory in Kubrat Pulev. The great thing about the whole situation is Bob Arum promotes both Tyson Fury and Kubrat Pulev. So there is clearly a deal to be done if, and you are quite right, if Deontay Wilder exercises this rematch clause, there's nothing we can do. That fight's happening and we accept that. I think Fury accepts that as well. Um, I hope he doesn't. But I'm confident he will. I mean, what else is he going to do? If he walks away from the rematch, he has to fight, what, a, a tune-up bout? You know, I mean, that basically says I'm a beaten individual. You know, Anthony Joshua, when he lost to Andy Ruiz, everyone said, oh, he shouldn't rematch Andy Ruiz. He should come back, take a bit of time, get his confidence back. Listen, from the moment that we sat in the dressing room after the fight, all we talked about was the rematch. And now we'll see the championship mindset of Deontay Wilder. So kind of it's out of our hands, but I'll make one thing clear. If there is no rematch, we want to do everything we can to make AJ against Fury next. If Wilder comes out and rematches uh, and, and announces he wants a rematch, no problem. We fight Kubrat Pulev. Looks like June 20th at Tottenham Hotspur Stadium in front of 70,000 AJ comes home to fight in London. But for us, for AJ, the clear priority has always been undisputed. And if there's a chance to fight AJ next, we will grab it. Uh, Fury next, we will grab it with both hands. Have you talked to Top Rank yet about, I know the fight just happened on Saturday, but have there been any talks yet about trying to few, ask Pulev to sit off the side? A few texts. I spoke to MTK, who are um, Fury's advisors. And they, listen, the fight is so big. Everyone wants that fight. There's not one person that is thinking, oh, you know what, let's, let's not make that fight. Everybody wants to make that fight, but we are in the hands right now of Deontay. I mean, I'm expecting Wilder, I don't know about you guys, you know, you might know more than me. Wilder hasn't said anything since the fight. He didn't attend the post-fight um, press conference, understandably so. The doc, you know, he, 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 he took a beating that night and um, I'm sure he was advised not to go, but we're waiting to see his reaction you know I expect him to come out and say well done Tyson Fury but I'll be back and I'll be seeing you soon for number three but mm. we need to know fairly soon because our negotiation process is supposed to finish in about nine days time so and at the same time don't you think it's kind of weak if you wait to confirm the rematch mm. you know like oh I'm thinking about it I mean psychologically that's a big big mistake because what was there to think of? You either want the fight and you want to reclaim your heavyweight belts or you want to pass. If you want to pass, pass and let us fight for the undisputed championship. If, if Wilder is not prepared to take this rematch, we want Fury next. And I believe that will happen if he doesn't have to, to have number three. I saw some people who were critical of the fact that 
uh, Anthony or yourself weren't at the fight. Like you need to be there sitting in the front row. You need to tell the world that this is what you want next. Did you consider that? And what do you think of that criticism? Listen, for me, I have a show every week, right? If I start going to shows that aren't mine, I mean, one, I'll never be allowed back indoors again. But two, I don't need to be screaming. Like, you, can't, you can't win, can you? If I go, I'm a clout chaser. Right. Right? And if I don't go, oh, he stayed away. All I've done today is interviews, media interviews. Right? I can't do any more. We want the fight. AJ has never been an individual to jump up in the ring. You know, gate crash things, shout things out. He's made it very clear, not just with his words, but with the resume that he has. You know, this is a guy, and by the way, you see, you know, even Charles Martin getting a good victory on Saturday. This is the same guy who AJ fought after 16 fights and everyone said, uh, you know, Charles Martin, 32-0 and Southpaw, he's dangerous. AJ demolished him and everyone said he's rubbish. AJ beat Dillian White. He beat Dominic Brazil in his, what, his 17th fight. He unified against Klitschko in his 19th fight. He fought Takam. Then he unified against Joseph Parker in his 21st fight. Then he fought Alexander Povetkin in his mandatory challenger. Then he boxed Andy Ruiz twice. He's had 24 fights. Deontay Wilder has had how many fights? 45, 46. AJ has consistently fought top performers. And he's willing to fight absolutely anybody. He loves the Fury fight. We appreciate Fury as a quality fighter. But, you know, for the first time, AJ goes into a fight as the underdog. The Mm. betting underdog. And I love that. I love that look for his career. I love that look for him. He sparred Fury. He studied Fury. He believes he beats Tyson Fury. But we also know Fury is almost a maverick. You know, when he went to fight Klitschko, I said, no chance. When he went to fight uh, Wilder the first time, no chance. I even believed that Wilder would win this fight. So we know Fury is an outstanding heavyweight, but no one can be called the king until these two fight. So let's find out. Let's find out. If it was up to you, would it happen in Las Vegas or England? If it was a choice between the two, UK all day, every day. And did we lose him right when it got interesting there? Okay, we'll reconnect with Eddie Hearn there in a second. Fascinating stuff. And what a great promoter, man. What a great speaker as well. Um, you know, reminds me of, of Dana 10 years or, or so ago with, with the passion in which he speaks uh, and sets things up and has his finger on the pulse and is just so, uh, so, so invested in the characters. And this is something that we get. I mean, in, in, in mixed martial arts, you have promoters for a brand so you can't necessarily choose sides per se here as a promoter for fighters you can choose sides right you could say my guy is going to go in there and you know take down the other guy in this case it's joshua versus fury so i, I love that I, I love being able to pick a brain of, of a promoter we need more of those people in combat sports i know that they can be polarizing but you see sometimes organizations in mma that don't have a face you know, I've said this to the PFL people a lot. You need a face. You need someone who's standing up there and telling the world why we should watch your fights on Thursday night. You need a face. You need a guy with a megaphone speaking to the world. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important. Um, and so Matchroom has a great thing going with Eddie Hearn, as you can see right over there. So hopefully we'll be able to uh, reconnect with him here and, uh, and ask him a few more questions because I have plenty more questions to ask him. Eddie Hearn joining us after all the talk this past weekend. He seems to be very clear about what they want. It seems like they want that fight. Obviously, there's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. A deal has to be made. And there's a few things that have to get uh, sorted first. The first one being, is Deontay Wilder uh, going to exercise that rematch clause? Is he going to say, you know what, I want him next? I, If I were advising him, I would say, take some time, A, or let's build you up. Uh, once again, let's, let's, let's take, you know, I've said this before, I'm a big fan of tune-up fights, big fan of tune-up fights, build yourself back up, take your time, get your mojo back, get your confidence back. And if they could figure out a way to do the Tyson Fury versus Anthony Joshua fight next with all this momentum, be gigantic. Now I had a feeling that Eddie was, you know, when I asked him about Las Vegas 
or uh, or the UK for the site of that potential fight. And he said, if we're going to, you know, uh, nail it down to those two, then I would choose the UK. That's the last thing that he said. I have a feeling that he was also referencing a potential Saudi Arabia location. It has to be one of the two. And I would say it's a no brainer. I know that Vegas has been treating uh, Tyson very, very well. Um, but I think it has to be, it has to be one of the two. And I would say it has to be the UK if it was up to me. I know it's been treating him well, but like, come on. Two British heavyweights, as popular as they are at home and worldwide. I feel like it would be a slap in the face to the British fans who have been supporting them long before America was supporting them. You got to make that fight in the United Kingdom. Pick a stadium, any stadium, any one of those football stadiums. Pick one. Has Eddie had enough of us? Okay. We could do phone too since... Uh, I just want to get in a couple more with uh, with Eddie here before we uh, we move along to the next guest. Great stuff there. In a matter of uh, minutes as well, we'll be joined by Ioana and Jacek. We'll transition back to some MMA stuff. But how could you not love this? This is great stuff. This is such drama. After the fact, is he going to invoke his rematch clause? Is it going to happen? The negotiations, the multiple promoters. I mean, there were four people uh, technically involved as far as promoters are concerned in that fight on Saturday. You had PBC and Al Heyman. You had uh, MTK which, by the way, uh, manages the likes of Darren Till in mixed martial arts, Frank Warren, um, and, of course, top rank in Bob Arum. I mean, to think that all of these people came together um, to put on an event like this, like no longer can we say that these things aren't possible. No longer can we say that the politics, you can't use that as an excuse anymore. And we've seen this before. Remember with uh, Lewis and Tyson, HBO and Showtime got together. We've seen this before, but it, we can't use this as, as an excuse anymore. I mean, four people came together and two networks to make this fight. Wouldn't it be amazing in the world of mixed martial arts if we could do things like this? Now, the gap between the UFC and everyone else is so large that you, you can make the case that it's not needed. But there have been times where it would have been a lot of fun. Why, why not? If they can figure it out, why can't we figure it out on this side of the fence? Right? I mean, wouldn't that be fun if the doors were just blown wide open? Wouldn't that be amazing? With all the, the talk of who's truly number one and all this stuff, it's just a completely different landscape. And I would urge you, if you're not a fan, if you don't keep up with it, if you don't follow it, you're really missing out. Because while it's similar to mixed martial arts in terms of like what the point of these fights are, um, you know, the main thing is it's very different in terms of its structure. MMA is a lot more like pro wrestling, where you have like one dominant organization and then you have other, you know, smaller organizations, right? And when you compete for that one dominant organization, uh, you can't really compete for anyone else. Boxing is a lot different. Like the world is technically your oyster and you can be, you know, your own promoter and kind of seek the biggest fights. Now, typically you'll kind of stick with your own and whoever your promoter is, is promoting, you'll fight those guys as you're building yourself back up or up, I should say, not back up if you're just trying to climb the ladder. But um, once you get to the very top, things get really interesting. Once you get to the top, you can now start picking and choosing, you know, what the best path is and you can, you know, really start trying to get the biggest fights possible. That would be the ideal scenario, I think, for any fighter. All right, let's go back to the phones and say hello to Eddie. Eddie, you, you got shy on us? What happened? No, you know what? It was uh, Someone called me and I went to cancel the call and I pressed accept. Ah, and it, yeah, it was it was about the Canelo fight, so don't worry, we can deal with it. Okay, what is it? Tell us what happened. No, no, it was Callum Smith's lawyer just phoning for an update. Obviously, Callum Smith and Billy Joe Saunders both in the running for that fight, all calling me every day, seeing seeing where they're up to. So I picked it up and then had to get rid of him, and then uh, I think you had some problems your end. So apologies for that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Uh, by the way, you were saying uh, Vegas or UK. I had a feeling that you kind of said if it's down to those two. You were right. I was watching your stream. Yeah, I was watching your stream. You were right. I mean, look, every country who wants to stage major events is going to be making a play for this fight. You know, we, we just did the Ruiz fight in Saudi Arabia. They will want nothing more than to stage this fight. We know two Brits. UK, that is the place to do it. But we also know, and you know, of course, you know your experience in fight sports. Sometimes offers come in that are simply too big to turn down. And I think that if you ask Tyson Fury and you ask 
and you asked Anthony Joshua where this fight needs to take place, they would both say London. Yeah. You know, they would both say England. But Tyson Fury's last four fights now have been in America. So, you know, he's, he's made a name for himself there. We have to see how the pay-per-view numbers looked from the weekend. We have to see what kind of gate can be generated. And I think my problem is, is that sometimes I'm a little bit too honest with the fans, you know? And I get a lot of criticism and stick and say, you know, people say to me, how can you even look at Saudi Arabia or this other country? It doesn't, the money doesn't matter. You know, the fighters have enough money. And it's like, guys, I'm really sorry, but I live in a world that's called the real world. You know, these guys have advisors, they have managers, they have lawyers. And ultimately, this is the biggest fight that either of them can have. So in an ideal world, the fight would take place in the UK. But, you know, there's going to be a lot of people gunning for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world fight. And I appreciate that honesty. I would urge you to not uh, to not change that. Um, quick side note: um, I don't know if you saw this, but Manny Pacquiao has uh, recently signed with Paradigm Sports Management, who also mm. manage uh, Conor McGregor. I was wondering what you thought of that, and I understand that he's now talking to promoters about his next boxing match. I'm wondering if you've spoken to Manny as well. Well, I've, I've had a number of conversations with Audi, um, and you know we definitely would like to make a play for Manny Pacquiao to fight on the zone next in Saudi Arabia. Mm. You know, we've got now a partnership with Skills Challenge Entertainment, which is our partners who, who we staged the Saudi fight with Andy Ruiz and Anthony Joshua to compete, uh, to complete a number of shows there this year. The next one is planned for early July. And Manny Pacquiao is definitely a fighter that they would love to have on board to box in Saudi Arabia. Now, one of the problems is with um, Manny Pacquiao is it seems that there's 162 people claiming to represent him right now. With, with Audi and Paradigm, you know, uh, looking to have the only kind of official link and, uh, you know, recorded link of at least a conversation between the two of them where Manny confirms he's being represented by Audi. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm more than happy to... Um, discuss with Audi and, and do a deal with Audi. We've been getting on great. We've been having some really good conversations. Um, as far as the MMA side's concerned, it's not really my business. It's not my market right now. And all I'm concerned about is trying to make a fight between Manny Pacquiao and a top welterweight out there. I mean, we have this Saturday on DAZN, just a brilliant fight with Mikey Garcia against Jesse, Jesse Vargas. Mikey Garcia has made it quite clear that if he comes through on Saturday night, he would like to face Manny Pacquiao next. And for me, Manny Pacquiao against Mikey Garcia is a great fight also. But Jesse Vargas has got other thoughts himself. So we're, we're in the marketplace to try and do a Manny Pacquiao fight for sure. Um, I don't like Manny Pacquiao against Conor McGregor, to be honest with you. I don't see the, I don't see the, the, the narrative and just the... the the synergy in that fight, you know, Floyd and Connor understand it all day long. Never going to be a competitive fight, but two of the best self promoters in sport, two guys at the absolute top of their individual um, game. But, and they gelled together so well, didn't they? You know, press conferences, 15,000 people. And, you know, it was a mega event. I don't see that same synergy between Manny Pacquiao and Connor McGregor. In fact, I think, the press comments is that everything, it just wouldn't work, you know? And uh, for me, the focus for Manny is is on trying to just sign him into a fight for, for Matrim and Design. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I feel like I could talk to you for now. There's so much that I want to ask you, um, Eddie, but unfortunately we're out of time. So can I ask you two true or false questions before we, we let you go, okay? okay? Number one, mm -hmm. will Antonio Brown fight in a boxing match promoted by you this year? <laughs> true or false? Well, true that I want to make it happen. I'm going to go true. I'm oh. going to go true because I think we're going to make it happen. You know, we did we did a we did KSI Logan Paul. We did massive business all around the world. This is something different. This is a crossover fight between you know one of the most well known American footballers in the world and a huge YouTube star. You know, I want to try and make that fight. Yes. So you're going to see a yes from me on that. Okay. True or false? Will Tyson Fury versus Anthony Joshua happen this year? True, true. Because even if Wilder rematches, we won't make that fight for December. You know, my Amazing. only worry is how far, how long 
Wilder has to sit out before he's ready to fight again. You know, we don't know about the ear injury. We heard he had a leg injury going into the fight. It looked like his mouth was pretty busted up as well. I'm sure he'll get a, a suspension from the uh, Nevada Commission on time, time out of the ring. But for me, you know, honestly, I will do everything I can to make that fight. This is a historic moment for our country and the sport of boxing where two British heavyweights get the chance to prove who is the king. And right now, it's between Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury to decide who is the best heavyweight in the world. And I'll back our man all day long. Tremendous stuff. Eddie, I can't thank you enough. Next time, I'd love to talk to you about the art of promoting and what you've done with your career and the, the breath of fresh air that you've become as far as promoting is concerned. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, keep up the great work with Matchroom. Good luck with the event this weekend. And uh, good luck trying to make that fight. Thank you. Subscribe to the zone for the big show on Saturday. All right. There he is. Eddie Hearn joining us. Appreciate uh, his time and the plugs as well. Great stuff there. So let's see if he gets it done. Let's see if he's able to do it. Let's see if uh, all the sides are able to come to the table and make it happen. All right. On Friday, I was in Oklahoma City covering the Denver Nuggets versus Oklahoma City Thunder game. I was doing sidelines. I met Michael Malone, head coach for the Nuggets. I met Billy Donovan, head coach for the Thunder. Who knew? Huge MMA fans. Bigger than all of them, Steven Adams, the star center for the Oklahoma City Thunder. This man was referencing interviews that I did back in 2011. Wanted to talk MMA all night long. It was great to catch up with him. Here's that conversation. Standing alongside Thunder center Steven Adams, who had a phenomenal game. 19 points and 17 rebounds. But, Steven, we're not here to talk about that game. We're here to talk about some fights. And in about 24 hours' time, the UFC is in Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah. Did you know this? Yes, I did. I did know this. It was, uh, it was really, really good, honestly. They, they're going to have a really good time, and the boys should pull through. You know what I mean? Yeah, one of your guys, Dan Hooker, is fighting in the main event against Paul Felder. I know he was at a charity event of yours in September. Yeah, yeah. Him, and, you, uh, you, uh, him and Izzy, and we will get to Izzy in a second, but yeah. what do you make of that matchup between Hooker and Felder? Who do you like? And don't be biased. Oh, 100% I'm going to be biased. i got to support my boy. Um, no, but in all seriousness, the, the way the fight happened, I thought, was quite organic and real. You know, there's just Dan Hooker just won his fight, and then he just... Ask the dude. It was just, I thought it was like brilliant in that sense. So, yeah, obviously i got to support him. Plus, you really follow this, this sport, right? I mean, to know that, you have to follow closely. You're yeah. a big fan. Yeah, I am. I am a big fan of uh, UFC. They're very, I mean, it's very entertaining for me. Um, my favorite fighter always been uh, Habib from oh. way back in the day. It's always been Habib. And then next coming up is Zabit. So are we still doing yeah, that? He's, he's intense. Have you seen his little brother? Yes. You seem to like the Dagestani fighters. I just find them I find them quite interesting, especially like the wrestling side of things. Like it, it's almost like a uh, you know when jiu-jitsu first came in and like no one really knew what to do. Like this is way back. Like I kind of feel the same thing with his like wrestling. Like no one really knows what to do when he gets his grabs. Like it's pretty intense. Anyway, yeah. Big fan obviously. Big fan. So if you're a Habib guy, that means you're not a Conor McGregor guy, right? I am too. Oh. Yeah, yeah, and, and it's like... It's you can only be one. Yeah, I am. I, I 100% I go Habib regardless if they do go up, but I do enjoy watching Connor as well. You know, I just enjoy fighters, mate. Like, you know, they got their own little thing, but 100% I'm behind Habib. Okay. Yeah, that's my, that's my thing. The MMA world is uh, very anxious for April 18th. That's when Habib is scheduled to fight Tony Ferguson. They've been scheduled to fight four times. This is the fifth time. Who do you like in that match? Because some people think Tony could do it, could be the first guy to beat him. What do you think? Yeah, he's a, yeah. Tony's Tony's funny man. He's a he's an interesting dude. Eh? He's just he's amazing how he just stays in the pocket always. Eh? He's just yeah. He's, I I find him. What I find most entertaining about him is his workouts, mm, yeah. and even his old school workouts when he was like first. So he's like running on tires and oh bro, it's just he's a brilliant fighter man. I just yeah, he's he's good. It should be a good fight regardless, man. Um, just because he's he's such a tough dude. Um, Tony just like a very hard headed dude. You know what I mean? So. I think it should be a really good fight. In a couple of weeks, we have Israel Desanya going up against Yoel Romero, and I know you're friends with him as well. Yes, how how close are you guys? Do you guys still keep in touch? I know he was at that event too back in September. Yeah, that's what, that's what it was. He's he's actually really close with um, my sister, really? uh, well, because we are from the same hometown. So um, he, obviously he's a bit older. So I mean, him and my sister, uh, they were friends all through high school, or whatever. And then yeah, because he was a he was a hip hop dancer back yep. then. Yep. Yeah, and then, yeah, it was good seeing it when we were at the charity event to see them kind of interact. They were like, what's up? And it was just back the normal way. So, I mean, the relationship there is more, I have to respect them as an elder. You know, it ain't so much like, oh, Adesanya's my boy. It's like, oh, you know, thank you. 
you know, you, your relationship with sister, so elders. Yeah, it was funny to see you ask him for a photo. Like, you know, you're an NBA superstar yeah, and you're know, you're being a fan next to those cool guys. Too. I try to be real cool, just like oh, yeah. trying to play it off. But yeah, it was exciting. It was really good from him that he actually showed up to uh, the event. Him and Dan Hooker. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was obviously it meant a lot, but it's like really nice that they gave the time. You know what I mean? So it's good stuff. And the, the the rise of mixed martial arts in your home country of New Zealand has been an unbelievable story. City kickboxing, led by their head coach Eugene Behrman, all these fighters, Kai Kai France and Dan Hooker. Yeah. What do you make of this? Did you see this coming? Uh, no, but it's it's really good that um, I think w when it started uh, was the bro. Wow, what's his name? It's slipping my mind. Samoan dude. Mark Hunt. Yeah, Mark Hunt. Sorry, man. Legend. Yeah. So like, I think it started with him because he's, you know, I mean, he just held it down for just the culture. I thought he represented New Zealand really, really well. Um, just no bull sort of dude. Um, yeah. So I think he started off there, and then like the rise of MMA, just the awareness of it, just kept going up and up from there, which was great. And then now you got obviously Adesanya and then Dan Hooker and stuff like that. Like it's. It's even better because now we're even getting events in, in New Zealand, which is huge, which is like, it's absolutely huge, man. It's like, I'm just so happy that the country gets the host, right. you know, you know, see, which is like, you know, it's really, really good. And I don't know if you know this, but May 2nd, right here in this building, the UFC is coming. Chris Weidman against Jack Hermanson. You guys will be busy in the playoffs at that yeah. point, right? Like, I've already, I've already tried to tell you, <laughs> like, which events I can't go to any. I have to just log in, so, yeah, it's unfortunate, but that's okay. That's okay. I remember back in January of last year, you guys went from Philly to Brooklyn. Yeah, we went to the Brooklyn uh, fight. Cejudo Dillashaw. Yeah, it was, bro, that was, was quick. For <laughs> one, it was quick, but it was awesome. That was my first uh, UFC event, and it was just brilliant, hey? It was brilliant. Seeing old Uncle Dana yeah. walking past. <laughs> hey, mate. Hey, mate. Yeah. yeah, it was nice. It was nice. Well, perhaps when this is all said and done, you can transition over you got the size you got the reach why not you got the power no way i'm heavyweight i have to go up against play like Derek lewis or something that's scary mate there's no chance <laughs> there's no way <laughs> last thing do you go out of your way like when 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 you see the big fights coming up like izzy's fight in a couple of weeks will you try to go out of your way and watch it live avoid spoilers yeah. Yeah. depending on what the schedule is for yeah, the team yeah. definitely 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 um just because it's, I mean, like, you know, I go on my way to try and do fights, but this one particularly, just because it is the New Zealand boys, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, regardless of um, which one it is, it's just any of the New Zealand fighters, man. Try and go in there and watch them, support the boys. Yes, sir. Yeah, lads. Thank you very much for the time. Appreciate it. And again, congrats on the great win tonight. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cheers. How much fun was that? Thank you very much to the uh, Thunder PR staff for setting that up. And you could tell just how big of a fan he is. We spoke for like 20 minutes afterwards about all things MMA. It was great to talk to him and great to meet with him as well about, uh, you know, just all things MMA. It was, it was awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And again, thank you very much to Stephen Adams and the Thunder for setting that up. All right, now let's move along to our next guest. She competes for the straw white title once again on March 7th in Las Vegas. She attempts to become just the first person as far as female MMA is concerned to win a UFC title twice in two separate occasions. She's the one and only Joanna champion herself. Joanna and Jacek, kind enough to join us from Florida. There she is. Ooh, look at those. What do we got there? Some Jordans? Thank Uncle Dana for setting this interview. <laughs> Yeah. Wow, those are ooh, wow, those are really nice. I wait. I I prepare some special pair for after the fight, man. Wow, <laughs> those are sweet. Those would be nice with yeah. the belt as well. How are you, Joanna? I'm very good. Just had my uh, last resting uh, session uh, of the camp. Uh, I'm feeling great, man. Uh, I did fasted cardio this morning, and I felt like. It was fight week, man. I'm full of energy and I can't wait, you know. Last few weeks were pretty hard uh, on my body, uh, my head, but I'm ready, you know. I put on a hell of the work. <laughs> you have been very open mm -hmm. over the past year about the changes in your life and dealing with things and trying to get your life in a good spot. How has the last few months been for you as you prepare for what is now the biggest fight of your life, trying to get that belt back? Drama free? Is everything going well? No, no issues that allow you to, you know, stray away from the task at hand. Yeah, actually, a few days ago, I, 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 I was talking to Dan Lambert, uh, who was at the gym today, and I, and he was like, "Wow, you are in a great shape." And I was like, "The most important thing that uh, I'm mentally more than ready, you know, and and I'm living my best life, and and I do what I want to do every single day, you know." That's the point. Yes. Going uh, there. 
Like, going there, believing, I believe in myself, and and I put on a hell of a work for the last seven, eight weeks uh, down here uh, in Florida, the American top team. But I've been working before in Poland with my physiotherapist. I was training in Poland before I came to Florida. So I'm ready, man. I'm ready. There's been some drama leading up to this fight in terms of her availability, right? With everything that's going on in China, she had to go to Abu Dhabi. She had to get quarantined. There was some question as to whether or not the fight would happen. Has that been stressful for you, not knowing if the fight, you know, she only got to Las Vegas on Friday. Was that that a concern for you? Like, oh my gosh, I'm preparing for a fight that might not actually happen. Uh, Yes and no. So sorry, guys. It was too much light. It's sunny today in Florida. No problem. Uh, So... uh... Yes and no, you know. I'm 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 happy she she's safe uh, in Vegas and that, that's it, you know. I just want to step into the octagon. I would not tend uh, this fight like moving forward, you know, because uh, like I said, I, I'm sacrificing myself every single day, staying far away from my family, uh, training really hard. So I'm very happy that. Uh, everything work work out very good. I know UFC have been pretty busy with bringing uh, Willie to 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 the stage, but you know this fight is on, and I cannot wait. And the hard work is done. <laughs> and and speaking of that story, I know that you shared that meme that upset her, and and you spoke about it afterwards. Do you feel like that was just a, a lesson learned? Like you just have to be a little more careful with what you do on Instagram. What did you take away from that experience? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. And I apologize for that. You know, uh, man, you know me. Like people know me. I don't have to prove to people if I'm good or not. You know, I don't have to prove it to to my God, to my people. You know, because I know who I am. I would never make fun of sick people, uh, people with illness, uh, virus. You know, because I'm helping uh, so many uh, people. Uh, who are struggling, uh, for example, with cancer, you know, and uh, the meme was just funny. The, the, I, I was laughing about uh, me looking so funny, but, you know, I apologize and, and I don't want to talk about any anymore, you know, but sometimes people are hypocrite. How do you say this? Like hypocrite? Yeah, yeah or, or overly critical, I think, is the word. Over, yeah, 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 yeah. So sometimes they, you know... They made this post. Uh, Some people uh, didn't know what was going on, but it's easy to blame on someone. But I do not care. Like I like I said before, if there is a hate uh, coming towards me, I pick the stones and I cement my my fundamentals. That that's it. But there is nothing to talk about. Uh, I apologize and I I felt so sorry to her, you know. And I feel so sorry to to the to to China, uh, to these people who have to struggle with the coronavirus actually it's all over the world right now so we need to be safe and take care of each other amen um you know when you were going through the the struggle of finding what's the weight for you and where you're going to go in your career after the second loss to uh rose namunis was there ever a point where you thought you wouldn't be in this position on the verge of fighting for the straw weight belt you made that division right are you are you so <laughs> grateful for the fact that you're here because perhaps at one point you thought maybe you wouldn't get another crack at a title of course, I'm very, very happy. It took a while, you know. It, it, it's been more than two years uh, since I lost the belt. So uh, I'm in the spot where uh, I had to be, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited and nothing, nothing to lose, you know. I don't have to prove anything to people and, uh, and, and to myself. I don't have to. I, I don't must. I, I just want to win this belt. And I put on her over work and I'm more than ready. Uh, prior to your last fight against Michelle Watterson, as as you may recall, there was a lot of drama about your your weight cut. I know that we're <laughs> a little less than two weeks away, right? Twelve days away. How is the cut going? I know I know it's not you know in the 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 most important time now. That's usually a couple of days before the fight. But how is it going leading up to getting to Las Vegas? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's beautiful, man. Well, like, what can I say? Like I've been working with Clint from UFC Performance Institute and. It's great, man. Okay. My weight is low, and I'm feeling ready, super strong and ready. No there concerns. Is nothing to worry about, not at all. And and so, do you have a nutritionist working with you there, or you just have the guys from Las Vegas working with you remotely? Uh, I'm working with Clint uh, remotely. That's it. But you know, I know what to do after uh, uh, what happened to me a few times. Uh, how I broke my hand uh, two times, how I was struggling with the weight cut, 
you know, I'm using my knowledge, uh, Clint's knowledge, and he's amazing. I really thank you, Clint, for doing this uh, to me, to to Adirapis, for helping us. And, uh, you know, everything is on point. You've been in these situations before. I mean, I remember you fighting at UFC 193 in uh, in Australia, 55,000 people. You yeah. defended the title so many times. She's never been in this situation before. She has never defended the title, right? She's never been on a big pay-per-view like this in a spot like this. Do you think that that will come into play in this fight, the fact that this is all very new to her and you've been here so many times before? Yeah, but she made it to the league, you know. So she's the champ right now, so all eyes uh, on her, but you know, uh, some, some some fighters they don't know they don't like to deal with the audience. They don't like, they don't know how to deal with the fans, uh, with big crowds. And I and I love it. You know, I, very often people ask me uh, if I'm nervous, uh, how I deal with it. But since I remember, since my first like, re- first real sparring, I love that. You know, and I, I I love meeting people. I love meeting fans, and I don't get more nervous because there is like few thousand. A uh, few thousands more people, you know, around me or watching me, and uh, I don't know. I don't know who she is outside the octagon. I know she made it to the league. She's my next uh, big challenge, and I and I, I know that uh, she's going to be in the best shape ever in two weeks, in less than two weeks. When you watch her fight, do you see any holes in her game? Yes, I do. I, I can see that, and I, I've been I've been watching her fights. Uh, actually, like two, two two days ago, yesterday, I watched her uh, fight, and uh, Mikey Brown, Cattle Kubis, my coaches, they they've been studying her, and uh, we know uh, what we have to do to to dethrone her good sides and and uh, use my uh, knowledge, my weapons to you know to to win the fight. What do you have to do? Just be smart, you know. Use my reach, my distance, uh, my beautiful jab combos, and 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 you know, I'm a real five rounder. I've been there so many times, and I've got this experience. My cardio is always good, and uh, you know, I just need to be smart. I need to be very smart. Use my footwork. We have some aces in the pocket. But, uh, you know, I'm always very motivated, very disciplined. I feel like I'm improving, you know, with every camp. And uh, I'm hot, man. I'm, I'm 32, 33 this year. And uh, I'm proud of myself, you know, because it was probably one of the best camps ever. You know, the way I pushed that was amazing, you know, and I'm very happy. Yeah, you should Very be proud shape. of yourself because I think there was a, a time where people thought you were done, right? They were writing you off. They said that you were ah, finished, right? You know, people like to living of someone's life. How you say this? Yeah, yeah, I understand what yeah, you're saying. So that's the point. Like, they always say, like, oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You should do that. Blah blah blah. I'm living my best life. <laughs> they can be just jealous, you know. I don't care, and I know who I am as an athlete, as a human and a woman, you know. And I'm I'm doing my best every single day. It doesn't matter if I. Uh, go to the gym or if I go to the to the beach or I do business, you know, I know who I am. And uh, yeah, I just have to have to be smart and 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 calm and and I'm ready. You mentioned your your cardio. She's never gone into the quote unquote championship rounds before in her career. Twenty one yep. fights, never gone to the fourth or fifth. Do you feel like that's something that could come into play? Like would you like to extend the fight so that you can test her cardio and how it would, you know, actually play out in the fourth and fifth rounds. This is something that you of guys course, have talked about. Of course, she will be very dangerous in the first round. You know, she's going forward. She throws loopy, uh, loopy punches. She's very, very, very strong. You know, and she can, uh, she can knock knock people down. And, and and I just need to be need to be careful. You know, like I said, I, I just need to be, need to be be smart. You know, and take this fight second, uh, second uh, by second, but. From round to round, I'm just getting better, you know. Yeah, and 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 it just seems like in her situation, considering that she's never been here before, she looks so good. What impresses you most about her when you watch her fight? Not the holes, but in terms of what she does, what impresses you? Mm, she's very strong, you know, like her her hooks, uh, her clinch, her knees, and she's a warrior. Definitely, she's a warrior, and she's going forward. Uh, she's very hungry, and and I feel like. Uh, because of from where she's from, she's like very, very, very strong, you know, mentally. Mm. She it, doesn't give up. 
is the and it's going to be a good, a good fight, a very good fight. Is the dream scenario for you? You win on March seventh, Rose Nami Yunus wins. And then you, and then you to time. And right now I'm focused on March the seventh, and I'm not looking. Well, you knew what I was going to say. You knew what I was going to ask. Outside, (laughs) outside. Of course, I, I'm not. uh, I don't look outside the box. You know, right now I wanna, I wanna win this fight, and I will, and uh, do my best. Just put on a hell of a show. So many people coming. Thank you guys for the support. And, uh, you know, after the fight, I just want to celebrate as hard as I can for a few long weeks. But we will see what will be next, you know. Okay. You know, I will. This one victory uh, that night will be bigger than all of my victories, you know. So it's going to be a big night for me, for my team, my people from all of the world. But <laughs> why will this one be bigger than see. the initial one? You know what? Because. I have learned a lot uh, since I lost the belt and uh, I know who I am and, you know, I don't like the way people define me and my career after I lost the belt and what happened, you know, but I know who I am and I don't have to, like I said, I don't have to prove it, but, you know, I want to make it clear that uh, I'm one of the best uh, female fighters all of time. And by the way, history is on your side because I've had uh, two Helwani road shows in June. Stipe won the trivia challenge and then he won the belt and you won the second one in December and now you're fighting for the belt. So I feel like history is on your side. Now, where is the belt? Do you, do you have it? Where is the it prestigious is. NWO title? <laughs> it's at home. It's at home. Man. Oh, okay. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I mean, that was a great moment in your life. Was I mean, it was a I, shocker. Yeah. No one thought you were going to win, including you. Yeah, because I don't watch fights, man. <laughs> I don't follow, you know. It, it's my big hobby, big passion, but it's business, man. <laughs> That's right. And uh, I still can't believe you did it, but it was a great moment. And so hopefully you'll defend that title as well, right? I, can't, I just proved that you have, we always have to fight till the end, you know. Till the very, very end. That's right. Um, and by the way, what about Polish MMA? Jan Bachowicz winning uh, last weekend, two weekends oh, ago, wow. and you? We could have two Polish champions by the end of the year. So big. So big, so big, and I'm very happy for Jan. We are very close. We used to compete together in Muay Thai. Uh, I, I took second, he took first in Korea in 2008 at the World Championship. I, I'm very happy for Jan and, and looking forward uh, to, to watch him fighting for the for the belt. You know, I love John Jones. It's not going to be easy, uh, but you know. It would be good, that <laughs> Polish power. And and uh, last thing, it, it, has the drama died down at ATT with Colby and Dustin and Jorge? How's it been these days? Has it cu- quieted down a little bit? It's good. Colby is back to training. He seems very calm. You speak to he him? He knows he has. You know, oh, of course not. We got into the arguments before my last fight, so oh. I don't want to talk to him. He needs to apologize, you know. What do you say? Oh, nothing. <laughs> An argument at the gym? He knows. He has to bow down, you know, to the queen and say sorry. Oh, my gosh. I don't care. Like, the guys should respect. We should respect each other. This is what we do at ATT. And, I'm, uh, you know, it's an amazing place. We have just more and more people coming from all over the world. And we are helping each other. We all respect each other. You don't have to like, love all the people, you know. But somehow we are teammates and, and we have to support each other, you know. And and um, the number, uh, Richie, who is the manager and all the coaches are putting tons of work to keep it uh, like a family, you know, like keep it to keep it uh, like keep it, keeping good structure, you know, and 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 Colby should be more respectful uh, to his teammates and and women, you know, in general, you know, he should learn how to say hi, sorry, I apologize, but you know, he's getting there. He'll get there. He'll get there. For now, March 7th, the return of Joanny and Jacek against yeah. Zhang Wei Li. What a great title fight that's going to be uh, in Las Vegas on ESPN Plus pay-per-view. Joanna, great to catch up with you as always. Thank you so much for Thank the time. Thank you so much. And we'll see you out there in Vegas. <laughs> yes, good luck. Bye. There she is, Joanny and Jacek, the pride of Poland. Another crack at the belt. She can make history on March 7th, becoming the first uh, female to win a UFC title on two separate occasions. Of course, she put that division... Uh, on the map when she uh, fought Carlos Sparza, won the belt, and then had that long reign. Now she tries to win the title again. Had the one pit stop at 125, lost to Valentina Shevchenko, now back at 115. Looked great in her last fight against Michelle Watterson. Let's see if she gets it done. Now, speaking of the women's 
flyweight division. The champion is still, of course, Valentina Shevchenko. We just saw her in Houston. Great win for her over Caitlin Chukagian. She is back in action on June the 6th. And her opponent is a good friend of the show, the one and only Dr. Neville, Bad Mofo Jojo, the pride of Scotland. Joanne Calderwood. Yes, Jojo's finally getting a title shot. June 6th. Location, TBD. We hear Australia, but we're not sure just yet. Anyway, here's how we got it done. We made it happen on this show. Take a listen. Especially in your weight class, you know, there aren't a lot of contenders. You mentioned, you know, getting a big fight or even Valentina Shevchenko. Do you really feel like you are ready for Valentina Shevchenko now? Yeah, and I feel like I've proved it. Like, I'm fighting these girls at the top, top five. Uh, right now, I've, I'm tied with her for the most uh, wins in the flyweight division. I've got the the most significant uh, strikes right now, and I just feel like I'm exciting, and I always bring it, and I look forward to those kind of fights, and I want to challenge myself, and I feel like I've been doing this for a very long time. My career has been very up and down, but it's brought me to this moment and I'm the best I've ever been in my career and I've found where I'm supposed to be and I, it couldn't happen at a better time. I'm getting the sense that the next fight for you is Joanne Calderwood. Do you agree with me? Am I on to something here? Uh, probably yes, uh, because for me uh, right now it uh, uh, makes sense. She's number three, ranked number three. Mm, I think yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Maybe we didn't actually get it done, but I feel like we spoke it into existence. So there you see it. It's going down June 6th. Location TBD, but most important, Joanne Calderwood fighting for the UFC title. How exciting is this? And there she is, the one and only Joanne Calderwood. Joanne, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well. Congratulations on getting this title fight. What was your reaction when you got the call that it's actually happening? Yeah, I'd done some laps on my around my living room and was screaming and just I was very excited. Me and John were jumping up and down. So yeah, this is this is a dream come true just to get the opportunity. So I'm very excited. One thing that you said in that clip that that kind of sticks out to me is, you know, you've been through so much in your career, so many highs and lows and changing camps and changing countries where you train, now settling in in Las Vegas. Was there ever a point where you thought this maybe isn't in the cards for me? Maybe I won't realize my potential. I'll never even get a chance to fight for a UFC belt. Yeah, like uh, I can remember. It's funny because I'm hoping the title uh, fight is in Australia because I remember finding myself in Australia and uh, nearly giving up in the support the sport I was like injured and just in a very bad uh, mind space and I feel like in Australia I was there for like three months and I'd done a lot of self-care and I got that bug back and that motivation and I'm glad that uh, I didn't give up and I'm here now and things started things started changing in my life and in my my career so I can't I'm just very motivated and very excited and just buzzing for this opportunity when, when was that Australia trip yeah uh, around two two and a half maybe two years ago it was before I came out to Las Vegas Okay, and and what led to you kind of finding yourself? Like, why is that the trip that you think of? Because I took a step back from the sport, and I done a lot of self healing, and yeah, and just looked after myself. Like I had a lot of years, uh, <laughs> I put my body and my mind under a lot of uh, kind of trauma and uh, with trying to make straw weight uh, towards the few, last few years was very tough on my body and my mind. So, yeah, just took a step back and it worked out. Yes, it clearly has. And now here you are about to get this title shot. Now, we just saw uh, Valentina fight a couple of weeks ago in Houston. What did you think of her performance against Caitlin? Awesome. Uh, very dominant. And uh, she's she, she really inspires me. Like, I... I love how humble she is and how hardworking and she's 
she's not one of these. You, you see this a lot in the sport, you know, someone gets the belt and then they lose it. But she's she seems to be getting better. And uh, that's what I inspire to be against and to have in my division and uh, looking forward to the challenges she'll bring. When you hear people say that no one's going to beat her at 125, that, you know, I, I've even said the gap between her and the contenders at 125 is, is very large, maybe, maybe the largest ever. Do you get annoyed when you hear this stuff? Do, do you feel like you're being disrespected? Do you feel like people are looking past you? No, I know she's earned it uh, with everything she's done. Uh, I just know as long as my team respect me and believe in me and Valentina, which I know she respects, uh, me as my ne the next opponent for her. That's all I can ask for. Yeah, I'll maybe have to stay off the uh, the internet and because uh, there's a lot of like, oh man, she's unbeatable and uh, JoJo's going to get her ass beat or whatever it is. Uh, you know, there's that uh, doubt in everyone's mind, but she's earned that. She's put herself there and, uh, you know, is. Les Brown says it's possible, so I'm going with that and get my head down and going to do work my ass off and uh, show up on the night. Wait, who said it's possible? Les Brown? Yeah. <laughs> Who's that? He's he's my guy. He's my motivational guy that I listen to on YouTube and Spotify. Okay, so he told you it's possible. <laughs> now, specifically about um, this fight or just anything is possible in life? <laughs> anything okay. is possible. <laughs> I, I I dig it. I need to check out Les Brown. Uh, is it L E S Brown? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Wow. All right. Nice plug. Because you just kind of dropped his name, like everyone just knew who Les Brown was. Uh, yeah. I guess I I don't know how I came across. Well, I do know. Uh, when I was kind of going through my rough patch, he was the kind of one that I was listening to every day, and he's very. You if you if you listen to him, you'll know what I'm. I okay. mean, and, and where I'm coming from, like he's, yeah. And that's one of we saying, like, it, it's possible. By the way, did you think that you would have to fight again since the, the Andrea Lee fight in, in September to get this title shot? Are you surprised that you're getting it without having to fight since September? Yeah, I I verbally agreed to fight Jessica I We spoke about it in the PI car park. Oh. So I was like, yeah, that's sounds like it's going to happen uh, and this was just after she fought uh, she only had a little uh, cut under her eye but uh, I was like okay awesome this is going to happen and then a few weeks later I heard from the UFC that this guy wouldn't be ready and I was like oh crap so then I was like in kind of limbo of okay well what's next and then uh, Valentina and Caitlin was coming up and Lauren Murphy and Andrea Lee. So I just kind of kept myself ready just in case anything happened with those girls. And then nothing happened. And then I think when she was on your show, I was like, hey, this this could actually happen. Especially, you know, uh, Valentina likes to stay active. So that's a good thing. And then we heard that Jessica Ayu is not uh, fit to fight. So I was like, who's next? Me. Yes. So then, uh, yeah, I started praying. And, uh, yeah, within, a, I think, a week or so, we heard. So, are you are you religious? Yeah. yeah, I've been going to church for the past two years. Oh, wow. Has That's that been part Christian. of the transformation as well? Yeah, I would say so. Okay, I like it. Uh, by the way, are you wearing hand wraps right now? Yeah, it's in between <laughs> sessions. I just hot pads and oh. uh, we're going to start pro practice. I'm actually a little bit late, so. Oh my gosh, now I feel horrible. <laughs> okay, well, we won't keep you very long. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know. No, it's Danny fine. didn't tell me he was in the middle of practice, but we're a little bit late to get to you as well. You can blame Eddie Hearn for that. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Um, and by the way, uh, congratulations. I don't think we've had you on the show since you got engaged. Mazel tov. Oh, thank you so much. That's we very actually, exciting. Uh, yeah, we, we just put in an offer for a house on Friday and we got a uh, notice back yesterday that we got uh, approved wow. and accepted. So exciting, exciting stuff. We've just moved gems and now we're going to move house and 
So it's all happening at once and obviously the big news about the title fight. So everything's happening and really excited. Uh, do you know when you'll be getting married? <laughs> Everyone keeps on asking me this. Uh, it's We've got, like, we just moved gems, so kind of was busy with that. And now we've got a very important fight to get ready for. So maybe after that, but no plans. I've not, I'm just enjoying being engaged. <laughs> yes, engagement is fun. Uh, if there's no drama about, you know, for me, engagement wasn't very fun because there's a lot of drama about actually like planning the wedding. But if you don't have a lot yeah. of cooks in the kitchen, then it's all good. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not one of these girls that's planned for a big, uh, big day or anything like that. Um, I would be happy just to disappear somewhere and do the deed. That's right. Um, and and as far as preparing for Valentine, I know you you at Syndicate. Uh, you're lucky because you have a lot of female fighters there. Um, one of the 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 top gyms in the world that has a lot of female fighters training there. But is there anyone in particular that you can bring in to try to mimic her style? To try, you know, she she's just such an aggressive fighter. So you know, um, she just she comes at you like a bull, and she's so technical. Is there anyone that you're going to bring in that isn't a mainstay at a Syndicate to help you prepare for Valentina? Yeah, we're working right now, and obviously I'll bring Sarah Kaufman in. Uh, she's a big part in my camp and for fights I love to bring her in she's very strong and I think for Valentina she'll be good for uh, the grappling side of things and body locks uh, but yeah like I, I used to complain a lot about syndicate there was so many southpaws but now I'm like yes and there's a lot of guys that can mimic uh, Caitlin so uh, sorry Valentina so uh, yeah very excited and the team right now we're all buzzing they're all buzzing for this opportunity and all, we're in a row right now it's only uh, the start of the year and we're already five and one so we've got a good thing going on yeah and of course Sarah once fought Valentina in her uh, UFC debut mm -hmm. Valentina's UFC debut many moons ago in your opinion I know it's early in the camp but and you know, I'm sure you've thought of her for, for a long time and have watched all her fights. What's the key to defeating Valentina Shevchenko? It's possible. That's it? Yes. Believe. Just, yep. Being in a good mind, mind space, being there in the moment, and just uh, being me. And obviously, I'm glad we've got these months ahead of us, and I'm excited. Uh, John Wood have, has got a perfect game plan and I trust in him and yeah, we're going to get it done and enjoy the process. Do you have the game plan already? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And do, when you watch her, do you see actual weaknesses? you see holes in her game? Yeah. Everyone's got holes in their games. You know, like no one's perfect. That is right. I love it. Or Do maybe I... you think she's perfect, Ariel. No, no, no. Well, yeah, put me. I mean, she's looked very good. I think. I think the the, the resume would suggest that at one twenty five, she's close to perfect. But I agree with you. No human being is perfect. Everyone has an off day, right? Even the great GSP lost a couple of times. Yep, we see it all the time, and especially in MMA. That's right. All right. Well, I will let you go, Joanne. I, I know you have practice, so I don't want to keep you. I don't want anyone getting mad at me over there. Uh, good luck to you. I'm thrilled for you. I hope that the haircut is going to be extra special for this title fight. And uh, are we going to find out if it's going to be Australia or not this week? Oh, yeah. So about the haircut. Yes. I've got a confession. Uh-oh. I got extensions. Oh, my gosh. So the shave bit, the shave bit is no longer... What? For the title fight, we're not going to shave the hair? No. Oh. It, it's, like, it's proper long. It's like, it uh, comes down to hang my ear. Okay. All right. So we're switching it up. Why not? Believe. That's all that matters. We don't need a haircut. <laughs> Joanne, I wish you the best. Thank you yeah, very so much. Yeah, so Danny says that he thinks it's going to be Australia. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Good luck to you, and we'll talk to you soon, hopefully before the fight as well. There she goes, Joanne Calderwood. Uh, she had uh, practice to attend to, so we'll see if it actually does end up in 
uh, Australia. That's the word. That's the latest. But uh, we'll see. They haven't officially announced the location just yet. Let's see uh, what they come up with. That would be June 6th and a good spot for uh, Alexander Volkanovsky's first title defense, perhaps against Max Holloway. So maybe they announced that this week as well. All right, uh, let's move along to our next guest. Uh, he has been itching for a fight. And, you know, with the UFC going back to Virginia this week, I thought, hey, this would have been a great spot for Ryan Hall. I mean, he's a guy who lives in the area. They were in D.C. in December. No Ryan Hall on that card. No Ryan Hall on this card. So let's catch up with Ryan Hall, who's been vocal online, uh, a bit maybe out of character for him. He doesn't like to do that sort of thing, but it looks like he's looking for a fight and is having a hard time finding a dance partner. So let's say hello now to the BJJ master himself, Ryan Hall, who joins us via the magic of Skype. There he is, Ryan Hall, joining us right now. Ryan, how are you? Hey, real. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's a, it's a pleasure as always. So where are we at? Do you have a fight yet? Uh, no, not at the moment, but uh, hopefully someday soon. So uh, you do live in the D.C., Virginia area, correct? Uh, yep, that's correct. I live in Falls Church right outside of Washington. So they were in D.C. in December. They're going to Norfolk on Saturday. Why weren't you on either one of those cards? It, it would it would at least seem to me like a layup to put you on one of those. Um. Yeah, I, I'm not n entirely sure. I guess it, uh, you know, it's been a little bit of a struggle to find an opponent. You know, I've been uh, directly turned down or been told that they're unavailable from 12 all the way down to six. I guess that would be Burgos, somebody, Aldo, Emmett, Stevens, Moicano, Frankie, uh, Cater, yeah, pretty much everyone down to number down to about Korean Zombie or Brian, or uh, I'm sorry, Yair Rodriguez has been unavailable, and uh, so it's been a little bit tough to to find an opponent. Do you feel like you're being frozen out here? Like, how do you explain such a thing? Ah, uh, hard to hard to explain it. You know, I mean, I, I was directly turned down by Josh Emmett. I was directly turned down by Hanato Moicano. I guess there's uh, three guys in the division in Frankie Edgar, Jose Aldo, and uh, Hanada Moicano, all of whom very tough guys. And, of course, Edgar and Aldo in particular are very, you know, kind of iconic figures, but they're holding spots in a division that they're not currently, I guess, competing in. And uh, it's it just seems like the there's a bit of a logjam that's that's difficult to deal with. And um can't see them being frozen out, but maybe effectively frozen out. Okay. Um, and have you been healthy? Like, could you have fought on that DC card and or the Virginia card this weekend? Uh, I, I could have fought in Virginia. Um, I, the DC card I could have potentially fought on. I almost ripped the tooth out of my head actually eating a taco, believe it or not. What? I guess in, uh, yeah, I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> like top two. It's its bottom tooth and it does that and that wasn't great. Oh my god! But uh, so that that was about a, a two weeks of not getting touched to try to get that fixed. But uh, fortunately now, if I get hit in the face, at least I'll just probably get knocked out. I won't. My teeth will hopefully stay. Oh my god! So gosh. Uh, that's a little bit better. But you know, DC would have been a potential. Norfolk could have definitely happened. But um, it's just been kind of slow going. But you know, you do your best. You keep training. But uh, I'm hoping to fight in May, uh, hopefully against the toughest opponents possible. That's always what I've asked for. That's always what I've hoped for and always what I'll be ready for. And also, uh, I heard that there's the potential for a uh, Zabit and Brown Ortega fight. And if one of those guys stubs their toe and gets hurt, I've uh, asked the UFC if I could be an alternate and slide in for that. Then. You hope that, that people know that you're ready and willing in the event that, that something does come up. So it seems like, um, based on the names that you've been talking about and and uh, you know tweeting about and and on social media, you want to take a step up. Like you are ready for the upper echelon of the 145 pound division. Is that accurate? Uh, I, I believe that I am, and I'm excited. Honestly, I I would I was excited. I asked to fight Cub Swanson, um, even though he was out of the rankings, because I was finding difficult time getting anyone to accept uh, in the rankings. And Cub, of course, I don't care whether there's a number next to a name like him or, or a Ricardo Lamas. Like, these are excellent fighters and, and world-class athletes, world-class fighters, so people that I would be excited to be in the ring with. So, of course, you know, it's I'd really prefer to fight up. That's great. Um, but only insofar as up, generally speaking, represents tougher opposition. But at, at this point in time, you know, uh, when I first got into this UFC in 2015, there's no way I would have been legitimately ready to to reliably beat people at that level i would have had an area that i could be superior in but they would have probably had a, a relatively easy time keeping me out of it but nowadays we try to do things a little bit differently and five years on not the same fighter and uh it's it's interesting i haven't really gotten to show a whole great deal of that because i fight so infrequently because no one will sign up but at this point in time uh you know i'm, I'm eight years into my professional mma career i haven't been playing games so uh 
I look forward to have the opportunity to face tough opposition, the toughest people available, and, and demonstrate what I've learned. Perfect scenario. Who's the next guy? Uh, how would you define a perfect scenario for you? If they said to you, all right, Ryan, you've been, uh, you know, you've been waiting anxiously to get your next fight. You've been calling everyone out. You're ready to go. All right. Well, do you solid? You could pick anyone in the weight class, anyone you want. Who do you pick? Um, I think it'd be really cool to fight Brian Ortega. You know, he's obviously a super tough guy, put on a, uh, an excellent fight against Max Holloway shows, you know, a great deal of durability, very tough guy. Um, great skills, has excellent wins over Frank Edgar, over Cub Swanson, over Moicano. Um, you know, tough on the feet, good on the ground. I, someone who would intentionally engage me on the ground, I think, you know, because he's probably not afraid of other people either. So I feel like that would be fantastic. But I mean, the guy Rodriguez would be a great fight. There's so many great fights in the top 10, top 15. It's just, honestly, I want to fight people that want to fight me. I mean, if, if at some point someone said, oh, hey, one of the guys that turns you down wants to fight, I'm like, all right, that's great. But you know, where, where was this, uh, this cavalier warrior spirit before? So I would be more excited to face people who are interested in getting into the ring. Does it kind of turn you off from the sport when it becomes a little political like this, or you say that the spirit isn't there? Do you feel like it's like, what, like, what am I doing here? Well, it, you know, I'll be, it'd be, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't a little bit frustrating. Um, you know, obviously I can be beat by anyone. And I know that at this point I legitimately can beat anyone on, on the roster in my weight range. And it's, uh, um, you just want the opportunity to play the game more than anything else. And, and uh, you know, I mean, I would, I got into martial arts hoping, you know, to learn self-defense, uh, try to study for the rest of my life, got into professional fighting, hoping to learn and grow and then eventually get myself into a, who is the best fighter contest. And, uh, that is only a, as you're well aware, only a, a portion of the professional fight game, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, when you're in the ring, for the most part, it is a who's the best fighter contest. And I would just like to find my way there. It's just it, it's a little bit it is a little bit frustrating that, you know, Sean Shelby has a really tough job. Obviously, he's an expert in the in the space, an expert matchmaker. You know, he's he's um, never been anything but a gentleman to me and has always been an advocate. And, you know, I uh, it, it's tough because I know that people tell him, hey, I don't want to fight this guy. And I would be a little bit embarrassed to turn me down, if I'm honest. But uh that's just me. So I guess you can't make people, you can't force people to get into the ring. And I'm actually happy about that because it isn't that will thing. But at the same time, that, that degree of freedom and choice, uh, you know, makes for some frustrating situations. What about finding motivation? Like, I know you love to train. You've, as you said, you've, you've devoted your life to martial arts, but just to train and know that there's no one out there who wants to fight you right now, or you don't have anything lined up. Does it, does it like, does it feel like it's tough to get up and go to the gym when you don't have anyone to train for? I won't say it's tough, but it, it's definitely you're always extra motivated, and it's you, you have a smile on your face when you wake up in the morning, and you know you have a, you have a fight to get ready for, and also you whether you're motivated or not, you know that someone is going to try to hurt you really in in a couple weeks, and there's no one that's going to stop that from happening but you, so you better get in there and practice, and uh, you know I really enjoy having that uh, that kind of exigent circumstance sort of feel, but uh, you know on the upside the being away from from the ring has been a little bit frustrating, but it's given me time to finish my college degree, which I was able to get done in between my last fight and whatever the heck the next one is. And uh, so that's that's been a little bit of time. So I, it's forced me to learn how to use my time on other things than martial arts, because if I was just sitting here waiting for a fight, I'd be it, it would be extra frustrating if I'm honest. Wow, uh, college degree in what? Uh, the the Van Wilder degree, liberal studies. <laughs> but right. I finally <laughs> finally scraped together enough credits. To, to be able to finish it out and actually really enjoyed doing it. It was, uh, it, I wasn't ready to do that years and years ago, but, but again, a little bit more life experience now and, you know, inch deep, mile wide knowledge, that type of thing. And how can, long did that uh, take? Like from your first day at school till now? Uh, let's see. I started when I was 18. So what am I? 30, just turned 35 yesterday, day before yesterday. Oh, wow. Uh, May have lost him there. I was going to say happy birthday to Ryan Hall, uh, the Van Wilder oh. degree. Oh, you there? You there, Ryan? I'm back. Okay. Happy Hello? birthday, by the way. Oh, thanks. I Belated. appreciate it. Um, well, go ahead. Well, that's a, a good thing to get out of the way. I wanted to ask you. I've seen some, you know, either non-ranked or even non-featherweights say, "Hey, I'd help you out. I'd fight you, Herbert Burns, uh, Cheeto Vera. Are any of these guys possibilities, or is this not what you're really looking for?" Oh man, um, you know, I, honestly, I would prefer to fight better fighters than Herbert Burns. But um, I, but Pedro Munoz really wanted to fight, and I uh, really appreciated that. Unfortunately, I guess the UFC wasn't super interested in letting a uh, 
crossweight class fight take place in that case uh you know i guess if he were to win you know would he have to stay at 45 i guess if he were to lose i don't know what that means so un- unfortunately uh it-, it seems like that isn't on the table because initially i was very excited to face pedro he's a tough guy good grappling you know good striking uh, a lot of experience and uh you know, that would have been really neat. And he was obviously, you know, excited to compete. But um, the randoms that just got to the UFC that have had a fight, they can buzz off. You know, I'm, I'm looking for people with, with who've worked their way there the same way that I have. And I'm not asking to fight the number one guy in the division. I'm not, I wouldn't do that. The only reason I find myself looking at the five, five, six, seven guys is because everyone between me and them has said no. You know, I'm not unreasonable. I just want to be able to prepare properly for a fight, have my eight-week camp and get ready to fight the toughest people possible. I don't believe that I have some right to fight Frankie Edgar or to fight Brian Ortega or anything like that. They've they've done things that I've not done in, in, in the sport. However, you know, I find myself in a situation where I'm just not sure what else to do because no one else will accept the fight. And that's why you, you saw me, you know, requesting a fight with, you know, Frankie, with Jose Aldo. It was not out of some disrespect or some misguided understanding or misunderstanding of where I stand in the grand scheme of things, but simply going, hey, you guys aren't scared, are you? And I know you're not. You may have bigger fish to fry. But uh, as far as like the guys with one fight, you know, two fights, they can buzz off. Okay. Wow. That's uh, that's very uh, that's very forceful of you. So you're just not uh, interested in fighting guys who are lower ranked. Not so much that you're not impressed by their talents per se, because it seemed like the Burns call out was really of no interest to you. No, absolutely not. You know, I mean, I, I just don't know what to say other than that. I mean, if people put together, uh, you know, some wins and they they do that, that's fantastic. You know, beating a debuting fighter in your debut fight doesn't get you a fight in the top 15. That just doesn't make sense. I'm not terribly interested. I'm not trying to be disrespectful to Herbert. It's just, you know, it is what it is. I that that's I haven't come this far and worked this hard to spend my time doing that. Fair enough. I hope you get the fight. I hope you get the fight uh, relatively soon. I appreciate you coming on. I know it's been frustrating for you, Ryan, but hopefully you get that uh, high-profile fight that you're looking for. And it's always fun. I I, I very much enjoy watching you fight. I know uh, some people, we've talked about this, uh, don't love it. I love it. I always find it uh, to be a fascinating thing. So uh, I hope you get that fight sooner rather than later. And again, congrats on the degree and the birthday. Thanks so much, Earl. I really appreciate you having me on, and, and thank you for your support. I, you know, I'm going to continue to do my best to learn and grow, and I hope that each subsequent fight will, I'll get to show a little bit more skill and a little bit more understanding. You know, I'm still only four fights into my UFC career, so we're growing significantly each time, and I hope that maybe, uh, you know, people will like what they like, but maybe we'll be able to, as skills grow, win over some of the people that didn't really love what was going on prior. Amen. Well said. Thank you, Ryan. All the best to you. Take care. All right, there he is, Ryan Hall, looking for a fight. Get this man a fight, not just any fight, like a, like a top fight against a ranked guy with a name. He's earned it. I like watching him fight. Anyhow, uh, before we get to our next guest, James Gallagher, I like watching him fight as well. Let me tell you about my good friends over at Blue Chew. It's a nice little music we got here. Yeah, as you take a look at the card this Saturday. Benavidez Figueredo. And also, I want to tell you that UFC Destined on ESPN Plus has followed Benavidez and Figueredo. And that comes out tomorrow. And that's a great show. It doesn't get enough play, but it's great because they follow them before the fight and after the fight. You don't get that with Embedded. It's good stuff. Anyway, let me tell you about my good friends over at Blue Chew. Guys, as you know, everyone has performance issues issues excuse me at some point want to avoid it get to bluechew.com bluechew.com has the first ever chewable that brings your performance to another level check this out they've got the same active ingredients that are in viagra and cialis so you know they work since they're chewable they can work faster you can take them anytime day or night even on a full stomach and this stuff is cheaper than those other two so this is an absolute no-brainer plus you don't need to go to the doctor's office or spend time waiting in the pharmacy line blue chew's online physician consult is a free and once approved your order ships straight to your door it's very very easy to use and the best part is it comes to you in discreet packaging Here's a great deal for you guys. Visit bluechew.com and get your first order free when you use the promo code Ariel, A-R-I-E-L. Again, bluechew.com 
and use the promo code Ariel. Just pay $5 shipping. Again, that's Blue Chew, B L U E Chew, C H E W.com, and use the promo code Ariel at the checkout. All right. So, in a matter of seconds, we'll be joined by James Gallagher. The UFC, excuse me, Bellator was in uh, Dublin uh, this past weekend. Liam McCourt. Uh, headline because James Gallagher was supposed to headline, injured his back, but they did announce that in uh, May he'll be coming back to headline their London return against Cal Elnor. That's a fight they've tried to put on in the past. So we'll catch up with James in a matter of seconds. Uh, but speaking of Ryan Hall, we did have uh, some BJJ action last night on UFC Fight Pass. Our good pal uh, Chael Sonnen put on another one of his submission underground events. And uh, the most notable uh, result was that Mike Perry defeated Ally Quinta. Now, he didn't actually submit him. Uh, It went to overtime, and then they did, like, some sort of scoring thing. I don't know. Uh, Stats Andrew Davis or Andrew Info was uh, tweeting all about it, and uh, quite frankly, it was a little confusing to me. But uh, a little surprised by the result. There you go. In escape time. There you have it. Mike Perry defeating Ally Quinta. And I posted this uh, video on uh, my my Instagram last night, uh, they had the weigh-ins. Oh, we even got some highlights here. How about this? Uh, there's uh, Jake Shields against Richie Martinez. Now, is he wearing? Uh, are, are those AirPods in his ear? What's going on over there? I don't think it's AirPods. I think it's because of his. Uh, you know, he's got those big earlobes. But uh, here you have the tag team uh, jujitsu, which is always fun. Chael, really a uh, a pioneer when it comes to this sort of thing. I mean, look at this. This is great stuff. And their production has gotten a lot better as well. Like the the mat, I like it very much. It's not like that sort of, you know, the mat that kind of like moves all over the place. Like they used to have like a yellow mat and it was very loose. You know, this is like a professional mat. Like Chill's running a real promotion here. You know, this is great stuff. Chill, you're all grown up. Anyway, he sent me a video yesterday of uh, I, Quinta and Perry. They had the weigh-ins. And I don't really think there's like really strict rules as far as the, the weight classes are concerned. But they had the weigh-ins. Two hours before the event, Mike Perry pulls out a cigarette a la Ricardo Mayorga, a la Robert Downey Jr. in WrestleMania, and starts smoking in Iaquinta's face. It was amazing. No one stopped him. It's total free-for-all. Incredible stuff. And then in the end, we have uh, Perry defeating Iaquinta. Who saw that coming? What were the odds on that? Big win for Mike Perry. So anyway, uh, good stuff. And uh, if you missed it, you could check it out on Fight Pass. Now, let's move along to our next guest. Say hello to James Gallagher. Like I said, uh, Bellator was in Dublin. And go check out the uh, the Leah McCourt Instagram page. She posted a great video earlier today of Molly McCann lifting her spirits on fight day. She was nervous. Uh, you know, this is her first time headlining. Big show, Bellator Dublin, all eyes on her. She was nervous. She said she wanted to go fly to uh, Barbados and just get the heck out of there, you know, and 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 just never think of this again. And so she showed uh, this video of of uh, Leah McCord, excuse me, of Molly McCann. Leah McCord posted the videos of uh, Molly McCann, her teammate, like like just dancing, dressing up, trying to make her think about something else. It was just great. It was a very mensch like move on Molly McCann's part to try and. Uh, lift her spirits and and make her think about something else. Eh, Maybe not lift her spirits, distract her a little bit from the task at hand. Because she said, you wake up at 6 a.m., you go fight at 9 p.m. There's a lot of sitting around and getting very, very nervous, a lot of anxiety involved. So she was headlining because James Gallagher was supposed to headline. Unfortunately, he got injured. That whole show is obviously based around him. It it all involves him over there as far as what Bellator is trying to do in, in Ireland in particular. They're doing a lot of shows in Europe. Um, but unfortunately, he got injured. But they did announce last week that he'll be returning in uh, in May against Cal Eleanor, who he was supposed to fight back um, several months ago as well. So that is exciting. And uh, that card, by the way, in England is going to be featuring James Haskell, the former uh, English rugby player who announced several months ago that he'll be making his uh, MMA debut, switching over to MMA um, with Bellator. So uh, he hasn't had any amateur fights and he did this reality show and people were thinking like, is this guy even all that you know serious about doing this MMA stuff? Well, apparently he is because he's fighting in May on a card headline by the Strabanimal, James Gallagher of SBG fame, SBG Ireland, to be exact. Is he on the phone? Do we have him or not quite yet? All right, all right. Uh, let's go to the FaceTime machine and say hello now to the one and only James Gallagher. There he is. James, how are you? 
What's happening there? I'm all good. How are you, brother? It's good to talk to you, my friend. It's been a while. So uh, most importantly, how are you feeling? How is the back? Yeah, I'm feeling great. I'm um, back in doing my, my rehab and training. Today was actually my first uh, training session back in SBG. So it was, so I'm, I was back in today and feeling good, moving around. And and now I'm probably going to be sore tomorrow a bit, but um, uh, that's expected. So I'm, uh, I just got to work on that and go go with what I'm given. What happened? What was the injury? Um, uh, I had a small muscle tear on the bottom of my back beside my QL. So I did. So um, I had a little small tear there, and I just I had the, it just seized up my whole back, and I couldn't train. And it was just one of those injuries where I just had to wait for a few weeks and wait for it to heal up, so that I can get back and get it moving and get stretching. And because when it was tore, I couldn't actually physically really move. You know, um, I know that you were in attendance on Saturday <coughs> at the event, and I was just saying uh, before we connected with you that Bellator's efforts in Ireland surround you i mean you are the star there you're the draw when they go there they headline with you how difficult is it to be at the event knowing that you're supposed to be headlining it knowing that this was made for you and you're sitting in your street clothes and you're unable to fight how hard is that for you yeah it's absolutely heartbreaking but it's just one of them things is like a a young mixed martial artist that it's just a different kind of experience for me there do you know what i mean pull out a few weeks out from the fight very close and then you have to sit and overcome all that, sit and watch it and see the other people kind of in there getting what I what, what was essentially mine. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it could be, it was it was a different kind of thing for me. But the way that I did it was I just looked at what, what the people in there were doing and what they did to get there and just took inspiration from that and thrived off it and used that to keep me motivated and keep me content in the process of recovering my injury. So um, uh, that, that's just what I did. I looked and I took inspiration from everyone else on the car. I mean, Kiefer was on a put on a spectacular performance. Um, uh, Blaine O'Driscoll had a spectacular win. Kieran Clark. And it goes all the way up to the top. Then you got Leah. Do you know what I mean? You come in there and, and take the, the main event slot and absolutely smashed it. Do you know what I mean? So I just took inspiration from these people and they're doing that and use that energy that they give give me to put into my my rehab for my back, essentially. Uh, what did you think of Leah's performance? Obviously, she wasn't uh, initially pegged for this, but they they thrust her in this in this spot. She gets a lot of mainstream press. She's got a great story. She's a mom, um, you know, very likable character. And here she is in, in her first Bellator main event in her home country. How did you think that she did? I think she did spectacular. She handled it like a true champion and went out there and did what she needed to do. And uh, and that and that's that. And I feel like she's in a position now after doing that that uh, that she owns that she owns that slot. Do you know what I mean? That they're going to have a difficult time putting her back on an undercard or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? She has risen to the occasion and and went and went out there and did it. So she she she's faultless. Do you know what I'm saying? She went out there and did it. And though she probably will crit- critique her own performance and stuff as all fighters do but and there's always le- lessons to be learned from it but she went out there and handled it like an absolute champion and there was no better person to go out there go out there and do it than Leah uh, you will at least for now be be always kind of linked to Ricky Bandejas he was on the card as well uh, and afterwards was talking about you know you maybe not deserving a rematch what did you think of his performance his uh, his great finish and then his comments about you afterwards he said that I wouldn't deserve a rematch with him. Yes. Yeah, no worries. Tell him he'll not be on my undercard the next time. <laughs> if he did that work up, do you know what I mean? So, well, I won't allow him on it. He was on my undercard, and that just that says it all, do you know what I mean? I went, I went and learned from that loss, do you know what I mean? And I, I rose to the top of it, and I handled it like a true champion. Do you know what I mean? True champions don't turn down fights. So that that's 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 my say on that, do you know what I mean? But all the best to me, he had a good win, and we well, didn't, he got his head poked off for a round, and then caught Franz a lovely right hand, do you know what I mean? And I said after him, well done, respect to him, and uh, shook his hand and congratulated him on his fight, but if he's talking like that there, he'd be sticking to America because he won't be allowed back in my undercards. Uh, and the exact quote, courtesy of Bloody Elbow, is Gallagher definitely doesn't deserve a rematch with me, but we'll see what happens after this fight. No problem. No problem. He needs me. I don't need him. Do you know what I mean? I've already moved on to main event slots and six-figure paydays. He hasn't. He's still in the same position as he was when he fought me. 
Do you know what I mean? He isn't he isn't rose up. I've rose up and I've got Carl ahead of me next and that's who I'm focused on. Ricky can say whatever the fuck he wants, do you know what I mean? But that's definitely a fight that I'm coming for. Do you know what I mean? And I'm the man in the in the control of that here, not him. Uh, at, at what point are you at what point is Bellator starting to talk about, you know, title fights for you now? Because, you know, the, the talk with you is always like, oh, they're protecting you. They're protecting you. They're not giving you big names and things like that. When do you want to start to get in those discussions? Yeah, by the end of this year, I want to go in there and beat Cal. And, uh, and I, I just don't want to go in there and beat him. So I don't. I want to go in there and uh, beat him in spectacular performance. And then after that, I want Sergio Pettis. That, that's who I'm coming for. Is Sergio Pettis? Yeah, they're protecting this and they're protecting that. And I'm running from them. I'm running from this. Full of fucking shit. Earl, you know yourself. Do you know what I mean? I'll step in there against anyone. Kyle's next and Kyle's going to get it. And then I want Sergio Pettis. So we'll soon see who's running from who after when this all unfolds. I like that fight. That's a great fight. And Pettis looked great in his Bellator debut. What did you think of his performance? Yeah, great. I thought it was a great performance, and that's that's who I want to be in there against. In there against people performing great. Do you know what I mean? I'm not running from jack shit. I'm coming for the best. I want to be the best. So for me to be the best, I want to beat the best. And the next in line, I think that's a, a good, acceptable fight for me to step up in competition after I beat uh, Cal as Sergio Pettis. But fuck Sergio Pettis. Cal's next. He's been, he, he's getting it. His time's coming, and uh, it, it's been coming for a while. After he did that sh- absolutely idiotic thing and not going and seeing the right people about his brain scan to get that whole fight pulled the very first time, for him now is now is his chance. Do you know what I mean? My back got hurt. I went and seen the right medical people and got the right medic advice and did the correct things, which was advised by me- my medical team. And now I'm back on the mend and Cal's next and he's the guy I'm coming for, so... He's next. Yeah, what a bizarre situation. It seemed like his career was over, right? He had the, the very heartfelt uh, message and said he had an issue with his brain, and now here he is back, not that long yeah. afterwards. It, it, it seems to me that he's like a fucking Egypt and doesn't know what medics to go and see <laughs> when he could have just went and asked someone. He could have went and asked someone. to be cleared two days before. The, so he pulled out 10 days beforehand, and then he was, because he was medically uncleared, and then two days before the fight gets medically cleared somehow. Don't 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 really get them, but Earl, the MMA world is absolutely full of idiots, mate. So it is they haven't <laughs> blue hard control business or have like a structure in their lives. They just I don't know, it's too many punches to the head or something must be because the absolute the stuff they say and even do you know what I mean? You're just looking at them going, You're just devalued your whole career. Do you know what I mean? And it's absolutely idiotic and I don't get it. But people like him, do you know what I mean? That just cost him mad money. Mad money just not to go and see the right people. How do you get a medical? How do you get a brain scan? Doesn't make sense to me, mate, but each to their own. It's not something I'd be up to. So in a perfect world for you, uh, get by Eleanor in May, get by Pettis and then title fight? Yeah, 100%. That would be ideal. Back in Dublin. Back in Dublin at the end of the year, who who wants it? I'm here. I'm not wrong. Do you know what I mean? They they can slate me all they want, Earl. I I'll never be accepted in this world of MMA ever. I don't. People won't like me. People will always slate me. They will always run me to the floor, and they will never take me for me. But I'm going to give them no fucking choice, mate. Trust me on that. I'm going to give them no choice. They will all be bowing down to me by the end of it. I love it. Um, I, I know you said you were back at SBG today. Uh, is it possible to say that the mood, the vibe there is any different now with Connor back and so focused on being active this year? Is anything different about the vibe at the gym with him being back? Yeah, 100%. Um, uh, it, it, the vibe, all, when, when, when you've got like a group, there's power in numbers, do you know what I mean? And when you get a group of powerful people, in a room together passing on the same message it's a it's a powerful powerful energy in the same building do you know what i mean and imagine that imagine that imagine that training room with the amount of athletes high level athletes in that same room passing on the same message the the buzz is absolutely phenomenal so it does and uh, it was great to be back in there today and just to feel that just to soak that energy up and 
I'm looking forward to getting in the amongst them and the mix of it all again. It's going to be a good lead up to me. Uh, last weekend was uh, a busy one in, in Ireland. I understand this weekend as well. What's going on with this fight convention? Tell me about this. It's happening this weekend, right? Yeah, FightCon. I'm, uh, I'm very thankful for FightCon to be able to go down there and uh, see all the fans that were supposed to come out last weekend to watch me fight. But now I look forward to being able to go in there and see them in person and go up and shake their hands and have a chat with them all and stuff like that there. So um, it's kind of, I feel if I come for me is my way of saying, I'm sorry for not being able to show up at the weekend and put on performance and come out and see all the fans that came, came out at the weekend to uh, just support them and say thanks for all the support as always. And uh, to ap- apologize, not apologize essentially because I couldn't have helped the decision that was made, but just to, Say say thanks back to them for always supporting me, even though that I had to pull out due to an injury. And that's happening in Cork City, right? Yeah, yeah, that's happening in Cork City in February 28th, I believe. And uh, there's a great bunch of fighters. Me, Kiefer, you got Wonderboy Thompson there. Um, uh, who else there? Ben Askren's there. You've got a bunch of animals showing up, so it's gonna be it's gonna be a good fun day. And I'm looking forward to maybe getting a few bit of training with three of the boys that are there also. Nice. All right. So something else to check out if you're in the area. MVP as well, I saw on the poster. So a who's who, if you will. James, always great to catch up with you, my man. I'm glad to hear that you're feeling better, that you're back on track, and I'm looking forward to the fight and uh, what should be a big 2020 for you coming up. Thank you so much, mate. It's always a pleasure to be on, as always, Errol. Thank you so much for having me on. Anytime. There he is, the Strabanimal himself, James Gallagher, kind enough to join us. Uh, never lacking confidence and uh, has big plans for 2020. That Sergio Pettis fight would be phenomenal uh, after this upcoming fight on on May 16th. And uh, speaking of May, um, we've got some news courtesy of uh, ESPN's Brett Okamoto. May 9th is a busy one as far as uh, MMA is concerned. We've got Bellator uh, putting on an event in San Jose, UFC in Australia, and the uh, much-discussed, long Rumored Jose Aldo versus Henry Cejudo fight, according to Brett, is uh, a done deal. I uh, spoke to Henry a couple days ago, and he told me that he was happy with his new contract uh, that he uh, had agreed to with the UFC. That was a sticking point. He expected the fight to be done. According to Brett, it is done. So uh, we'll get a Henry Cejudo title fight on May 9th against the uh, 0-2 Jose Aldo in his last two fights own one as a bantamweight. So new times as far as uh, title contenders are concerned. But uh, for Henry, it is important for him to fight a legend. And he's getting one in Brazil, of all places, going to enemy territory, if you will, in May. Let's go back to this past weekend in UFC uh, business, UFC Auckland, to be exact. Uh, we had the return of the UFC in New Zealand, and we had Australia's Jimmy Crute with a big win, a bounce back win, if you will, against Mikhail Oleksiejczak. He was coming off his first pro loss, and what a performance on Saturday against Oleksiejczak, picking up his second Kimura in the UFC, and as a result, is now one of five people to have two Kimuras in the UFC. No one has ever done it three times, so big stuff for Jimmy Crute. He's kind enough to join us right now via Skype. Jimmy, how are you? I'm good, mate. Um, yeah, just enjoying Auckland for a little bit this week and then go back home on Thursday. I know it's early over there, so I appreciate you doing this uh, in the morning on Tuesday. Congratulations on the win, of course. And, and I'm wondering, because I saw some some interviews with you leading up to the fight, talking about the mindset and talking about dealing with your first pro loss and and, and bouncing back, so to speak. Was your confidence a little different this time? Were you doubting yourself? Did you feel a little unsure because you were coming off a loss? Um, no, nah, I had never been so nervous before a fight, but um, like confidence and, and belief and stuff was, um, uh, I don't think I've ever been stronger in that aspect. So um, just like backstage warming up, I just felt so heavy and uh, my, my calves were cramping and I just, I just like, it felt, I felt very, very nervous, but as soon as I started walking, it, it just, I knew I was supposed to be there. And that's not common for you to feel those nerves? I feel a little bit nervous normally, but never like that. That was, um, that was next level. So wow, it was, a, it was actually a pretty good experience. And then getting the win on top of that, it just makes everything feel that much better. And is that because you were coming off a loss? Um, I think it's because I put full, full faith into myself. So you know, um, you know, when some guys don't put full faith in themselves because there's um, there's less to lose than the this time I I did I just 
believed in myself 100% and I didn't I didn't care what happened in the fight. I was going to get the win. I was going to get my hand raised. So it, um, it adds a little bit more pressure. How long does it take for that to wear off? Like, does the fight actually have to start for you to forget about the nerves? Or is it when you're in the octagon and Bruce Buffer is announcing your name? When does it happen? Uh, as soon as I made the walk. Okay. Because I, I was sitting just in front of the curtains and and um, he was walking out. And then as soon as I got to my turn to walk, it was, it was, it was on. So... Yeah, and, and what a performance. I mean, you didn't need a lot of time. It was a first-round uh, finish as far as the Kimura is concerned. You're, again, like I said, just the fifth guy to get um, two Kimuras in the UFC. Is that a move that you, like, would you consider that one of your go-to moves on the ground? Is that a move that you particularly like when you're training? Yeah, I love I love a Kimura. Um, you know, I have my little setups for it, and um, hopefully people don't work them out, out soon. But I've got, I've, got other, I've got other things up my sleeve as well. Um, but now Kimura is my go-to. Um, when I, even when I'm rolling high-level black belts and stuff, I can normally whip out a Kimura. So. Now that you know that no one's ever done it three times in the UFC, is this a personal goal of yours to be the first guy to get it three times? Man, uh, if I could hold another UFC record, that'd be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, and it's a, only only early in my career if I can if I can get my name out there as much as I can, I'll be going after it. So I won't um. I won't be thinking about the Kimura because of that reason. I'll just be thinking about the Kimura because I like I like doing them and they're very satisfying when you hear someone's shoulder pop. And speaking of being early in your career, you know, you're you're considered one of the bright young stars in the UFC, still under 25. Uh, we had you ranked as one of the top 25, under 25 fighters uh, in the sport in mixed martial arts. But after you suffer that first pro loss, do you, do you feel like people like jump off the bandwagon? Did you sense that people oh. stop believing in you and things like that? Yeah, you do, man. You really do. Everyone says it. Everyone says, "Oh, they're only there when you're winning." But, mate, there, there are a lot of people that um that have come crawling back after this one, and I just uh, just smile and wave. But inside, I'm just thinking, "Yeah, no, nah, you're not getting any, cl- you're not getting any closer than that, mate." But um, no, nah, I know, I know who the real, real ones are. The real ones are the ones that are slugging away with me outside of the limelight. So, you know, um. Yeah, I know, I know who's real. I've got a lot of lot of good people around me. Wow! So you've already experienced them crawling back, trying to get back in your good graces. <laughs> uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing how that works. Oh my! It, it, oh, it's just human nature. I think like people just want to be part of something big. I suppose, but you know, I know I know who's been there when it when it wasn't looking so good. By the way, after the fight, you shouted out uh, what appeared to be a teammate or friend of yours who I think fought, if I understood correctly, the night before. What was that all about? Um, one of my one of my best mates, Ricky Beecham, um, one of my main training partners. He's been one of my training partners for about five or six years. Um, he's just honestly like you, you are. You, you give him a time and place, and he rocks up and he helps you. Um, he's he's starting to come along in his pro career, and he had two fights in in one night the night before for a heavyweight title. He was um, the underdog going in. They put they pitted him against the favorite first up. He smoked him, and then he went and um, had a war war in the second one. So like, oh, I just like walking out. He went six rounds as a heavyweight on the local scene. I had um I had no reason to fear going three three rounds for that fight because of him. Wow, that is great. I appreciate you doing that, and you also won the fifty thousand uh, dollar performance bonus. What what does that do for you? Like, how big of a deal is that for you? Ah, it's massive. You know, it's a one fight I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about the bonuses. I wasn't thinking about any sort of win bonus or whatever. I was just thinking about doing my job and, and getting my hand raised. And it's the fight that um that I get it in. So, you know, I'll take that forward and and just focus on the task at hand um normally. But yeah, it's it's a it's a life changing amount of money. Um it's it's huge. Like I, I don't I don't have to I don't know. I just I'm gonna be smart with it and yeah, hopefully I can buy a house this year. And obviously, Australia has been in the news this year with those devastating wildfires um, that have just ravaged the entire country. Has that affected you in any way or your family, friends, um, anyone close to there? Um, no, nah, it hasn't really affected me. Uh, I think it's affected everyone in the country, actually, like just the devastating news. And, you know, it's it's a bit hard to um, get excited about everything when, when your country's burning. But um, I think the smoke, like there was a lot of smoke and, and just like... But we we had nothing to complain about where I am. Um, but like I, I know people that have been affected. Um, a lot of people lost their houses. A lot of people a lot of people died in there. So you know me me and um, Jake Matthews are actually doing a lot of um, 
trying to do a lot of charity work and, and trying to do like seminars and, and fundraising to, to raise money. But, um, you know, th those areas that are affected by bushfires are now affected by flooding. So Australia, Australia's weather is just crazy. What well, fires one week, floods the next. So, um, yeah, so it's, that's not been a, it's not been a good vibe back home because of it. And by the way, uh, on your Instagram, I see you wearing the t-shirt dad's army a lot. I think I know, is that for, um, is that for, uh, uh, Kelly, Dan Kelly, or is that for something else? Yeah. What is that? For? Yeah. Oh, that is for Kelly. Yeah. So Daniel Kelly, um, that's, that's, that's his little thing. Like, um, I don't know the reason why they called it Dan, dad's army. I just, I just think dad's Daniel Kelly is a bit of a dad. So yeah. he's the head of, of our little group. So it's dad's army. Um, he, he cornered four guys this weekend Amazing. Um, at the UFC. Um, so our little dad's army group, we're coming in strong. Um, yeah, man, we, we have, a, we have a good thing going in Melbourne. It's amazing. Um, last thing for you, anyone come to mind as far as who's next? I know you say you want Serkinov at some point again, um, perhaps maybe not next, but anyone else come to mind? Um, I don't know. I'm going to talk to my team. I need to talk to the UFC. Um, you know me, Ariel, I'm not scared to fight anyone. I think I've said that on here before. Um, we'll just, we'll just see what makes sense. Um, and you know, I'm going to win one more and then, and then as I said, I want Misha Serkinov. So, you know, if he wants to fight and if he wants to fight in Perth, we can go in Perth. But um, I don't think I, I think I need to win a few more to to earn that shot. You know. Yeah, something tells me we'll see you on that June sixth card. Um, that uh, perhaps they'll they'll announce in in the next few days. For now, though, enjoy the victory. Very impressive stuff and impressive considering what happened in the last fight. To see you bounce back like that was supremely impressive. So enjoy it. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it as always. Thanks, Ariel. You're the man, brother. Thank you. My pleasure. There he is. Uh, man himself with a big win, Jimmy Crute over Mikhail Oleksheshuk. Big Kimura victory. Now, that was the co-main in the main event. We had an unbelievable fight. Like I said at the top of the show, when they announced Paul Felder versus Dan Hooker, we all thought, all right, there's no way that this fight isn't going to be great. In the end, it turned out, I think, to be even greater than we all thought it would be. Uh, it was a fight that was ultimately won by Dan Hooker via decision. It was a very close fight, and what an opportunity and what a showcase for the New Zealand-born Hooker, who was able to fight back home once again, this time in the main event for the very first time. And he showed out big time, and he's kind enough to join us right now via the Magic of Skype. Dan, thank you so much for doing this. I appreciate it. No trouble at all, Ariel. Uh, congratulations on the win. Physically, how are you feeling a couple of days later? Um, no, I'm good. Uh, got, uh, you know, we, we both went to the hospital, got all checked out, all scanned. Um, nothing's broken, nothing serious, just a few, a few bumps and bruises. And, uh, I'll be, I'll be back to training by the end of the week by the looks. Wow. That is amazing. Now, before they announced the, the judge's decision, did you think you had won? Uh, oh man, it's hard at the time, you know, you're, you're in the fight. You, you can't, you can't be focused on, um, counting points or how fights getting judged you know you're more just trying to trying to look for ways to finish your opponent and, and focusing on on the strategy but i thought i controlled um a majority of the fight and i was pretty pretty confident what was your corner telling you going into the fifth were they telling you you were up that it was tied oh i knew i knew it was a close fight you know um but for a majority of the rounds so you know not not too many adjustments were getting were getting asked to me and you know if you if you're not getting asked to adjust too many times they didn't call for a takedown or anything that's just something that um that i felt i felt like uh a, a takedown would have would have separated us two coming into that fifth uh, paul felder obviously a very tough guy you're a tough guy as well was there and like we're showing some of these photos here was there ever a point where you're hitting him with shots and you're like man this guy's not even going down like what do i have to do to actually finish this guy are you having that internal discussion Nah, you know, when it gets to the fight, you know, you're just treating it as, you know, I take the take the personality behind the body out of it. You know, if I if I break the body down, if I stop the body, then um, I don't have to f worry about the mental side of things at all. Um, so I was more just focused on the on the physical side of things. But he's got he's got one heck of a poker. He's one heck of a poker player. I can tell you that much. What do you mean by that? Like. Uh, most of the punters, you, if you land like a good punch or land like a good kick, you'll see like a, a slight grimace or, or you'll see something like you, the guy will 
the guy will show a little something, something, but um, I'll pull further, not not once, you know, and then you can see straight after the fight, he's, you know, we've seen the damage that we inflicted on each other, so it's, he's he's a good poker player. <laughs> uh, I, I know it happened less than two days ago, but have you rewatched it yet? Yeah, I've watched it a few times. I'm pretty, yeah, I, I'm comfortable that I got the got the win. I thought I won the first, second, third. And and the fifth round, so I um you know I've, I'm confident I won a majority of that fight. Okay, so you don't think there's any controversy? You think you won four to one? I thought it was pretty clear. Okay, does it annoy you to hear or to read so many people saying that uh, they thought he won, that it was an outrage, all this stuff? Oh, everyone's entitled to their own opinions, you know. Um, so it is. This is a, look, Errol, this is the first time I've ever won a split decision. This is the first time I've ever won a decision that's been questioned. So this is this is all new to me. Mm. And how do you feel about it? Oh, it's just the way, you know, he's he's a tough guy. Um, it, took, it took time, you know, it took time. I had to play it smart. You can't, you fry. You know, you fry fish. You don't. You don't fry brisket. Paul Felder's <laughs> Paul Felder's brisket. You, know, you got to slow cook it. Oh, I like that analogy. Um, we had the moment afterwards where he uh, said he's contemplating retirement. What did you make of that? Were you surprised to hear him say that? Um, yeah, I kind of saw him taking his glove off, and that's that's when I I, I went over and I kind of uh, tried to put his glove back on and, and lift his hand up because that's not. Really, that's not the moment you need to make those calls. You know, go back, go back, be with your family. Um, you know, have a have a talk to your partner, have a talk to your to your team around you, and then make that decision when you're at home and you're you're comfortable. You know, in the octagon straight after a battle like that is it's not the not the time and place to make a a big call for your career like that. Yeah, um, and then you had the moment afterwards. Uh, we showed the photo on the uh, on the the stretchers, right, going to the uh, the hospital. What did you guys talk about there? Yeah, so they, it was funny. They held us back at the. They held me back at the entrance, and they're like, "Oh, his opponents in." But uh, one of my coaches, Carl Weber, he was outside at the time, and he's just like, "Bro, wheel them in." He's like, "Those guys, uh, those guys are our best mates now." So they wheeled us in, and um. He asked. He asked about my daughter. He asked how old my daughter was. I asked about. Asked about his daughter. Um, shared a little bit of insight there, and then um, yeah, just just wish wish each other luck for the future. You know, there was no no animosity, no hard feelings. Like uh, people, yeah, it's different. It's different when you get in there with a guy for for 25 minutes. Like we. We earned each other's respect, like from now until the day we die. Me and Paul Felder have 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 each other's um, have each other's respect. Mm. Did you see him at the hospital as well? Yeah, that was that was at the hospital. Oh, okay, okay, I thought that was at the arena. Uh, did you? And I think he's still there, or was released not that long ago. Obviously, had to stay longer. His face was pretty banged up. Did you see him before you left? No, I didn't get a chance to. Um, I asked. I asked if he was all right. I asked, um, you know, just to make sure that he didn't have any kind of se anything serious, or you know, his eyesight was all right. Like there was nothing serious. Um, the doctors aren't allowed to, you know, share information. So they let me know. Kind of, you know, they gave me just a generic thumbs up. Like he's nothing serious. Okay. That, that, that's a, that's about as far as they um, let me know. So that's good for me. You know, that I'm I'm happy that. Um, he's going to be able to go back to his family in one piece. Um, I, I would imagine the young girl that you held after the fight, that's your daughter, correct? Yeah, that's my daughter, Zoe. Zoe, uh, it was a great scene um, afterwards seeing you with her. Is that the first time that she's been to one of your fights? No, she was uh, she was there at Melbourne um, after the, I quantified as well. Mm -hmm. So she's been, to, she's been to two. How does she react to seeing her father in the cage fighting? Uh, she's still a bit young, you know, she's only 15 months. She was, uh, she was crying after the fight until, until I went up and grabbed her and then just let her know that you're all right. And she, um, she kind of, she kind of turned and calmed down a bit. So it's, it's good to have them there, man. You get, you get, um, definitely, definitely adds to the motivation when you're in the cage. 
Speaking of motivation, you, you have another great card for city kickboxing, right? The uh, the repeat of the three peat, as as Izzy likes to say. And you have <laughs> Brad Riddell and Kai Car France win, and now all eyes on you in the main event. As the night is going on, are you starting to feel a little bit of that pressure? Like I can't be the one, you know? We need to go undefeated here. Do you think about that sort of thing? Um, not at the time. Nah, not at the time. I was just focused on the task, focused on the job that I needed to do, and and how how I was going to get that done. For more, just the strategy side of things. Everything goes, everything goes very cold. Everything goes very calm, and and I take you know that's just that at the end of the day that's outside noise, you know. So I need to. I'm very good at controlling that. Very good at turning that down and just focusing on the task. Uh, we showed a, a video before the fight of. Um a ceremony where you, where you and Paul actually had to touch nose to nose. Um, and he went like through the whole team. Like Izzy was there, I believe. Kai Car France was there as well. You were there. What is that ceremony? What does it signify? Um, so that's a, that's like a, that's a welcoming ceremony in New Zealand. Uh, it's called a pofiti. And um, the, 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 Place we are is is called a marae, and uh, in Maori culture, that's a that's a spiritual place, and you know, it's like not of this world, and it's where people come together. So it was welcoming the UFC, welcoming all our opponents, um, welcoming them, welcoming them to New Zealand. Uh, but yeah, that's that's the funny thing about the culture. It's not necessarily you know the hongi where where we go nose to nose is not necessary a peace thing you know people in in the past and multi multi history you know hongi and then they'll they'll battle to the death like it's um it doesn't mean <laughs> it doesn't mean it's not like a like a handshake yep you're all right with me mate it's um yeah it can can mean a lot of different things but it was more just coming together and well uh, you know the ufc let me know that paul you know, he didn't get made to do that. He wasn't told he had to come down. He chose to engage in the ceremony. He chose to come down when he didn't have to. And that that I respect a lot. True or false, it seemed like you kind of like kept your eyes locked on him just a beat longer. And you almost like went a little bit like the 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 nose to nose with Volkanovsky and, and Izzy and those guys. It was a little different than the nose to nose between you two. Is that accurate? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, so... You have to follow the protocols. Like once you're on the barai, it would have brought, um, it would have hurt the mana. Mana in New Zealand is uh, like respect. It would have hurt the mana of Odaki Marai. So it would have hurt the mana of the tribe whose marai we were in if I didn't follow the protocol, which is nose to nose, um, you know, shaking hands. So follow the protocol, but that doesn't mean you're not. Um, entitled to let him feel your energy so that's more that's more i was letting him i was letting him feel feel my intention while still um upholding the mana of of the tribe fair enough now um getting to headline your first show in new zealand in the ufc and and everything that comes with that right and all the attention now that it's over what was it like did you enjoy it was it different than what you expected how would you describe it yeah, I did. I thoroughly enjoyed that. I thoroughly enjoyed being in my hometown, um, getting to put a show on, getting to put a show on for my home city. But yeah, it's definitely um, hasn't sunk in. You know, it's a, it's a lot of pressure, but it's it's. I felt like it made me perform well. I feel like uh, I enjoyed it, man. I enjoyed every second of it. Your story is unbelievable. I mean, even dating back to when it started, but even uh, like a year plus ago. I remember watching that fight in Milwaukee against Edson Barbosa, and uh, I remember talking to your coach, Eugene Behrman, afterwards and saying uh, maybe the towel th should have been thrown in, that you took too much damage in that fight, and you showed incredible heart in that fight. But to think of how far you've come, uh, you know, a, a year plus later, and now you're headlining shows and you're on this roll and considered one of the top lightweights, how did you turn it around so quickly? Um, I'm, you know, I've always been able to, to come back. If you look, if you look at any time I've taken a loss throughout my career and you, and you look at um, what follows that, it's almost like a, it sparks. Like I feel like I do my best work when, I, when I'm under pressure. You know, if I'm coming off a loss or I'm coming off um, 
I'm coming off some hardship or you put me on a, and you know you put me in front of my hometown fans as soon as as soon as you turn that turn that pressure tap up and you put a lot of pressure on me um it seems to to bring out my best performances so for this fight you know I tried to pile on the pressure as much pressure as I could because I feel like it it brings out the best of me Final thing afterwards, you said that you wanted Gaethje. That's in a perfect world who you'd like next. Why him? He's just an exciting guy. You know, six fights, six bonuses. Um, it's something that intrigues me. But then they're, they're, it looks like uh, him and him and Connor are going to go. If I was Connor, I would take the Gaethje fight too. You know, that's a that's a incredibly exciting fight. Um, you know, if he wants to stay busy. But if Gaethje's busy, then Poirier is the man, you know. Either Gage or Poria, those are those are the only two those are the only two options that make sense for me. I like that Poria one a lot. Yeah, the the, the Gage one far from done, but he is the front runner right now as far as what I'm hearing. Um, down to him and Diaz, and I would put him ahead a little bit for Connor, uh, which I think is a fight that makes sense for both guys. Uh, Poirier was on my show last week looking for a fight as well, and uh, I suggested to him the winner of your fight would would make sense. So uh, perhaps he'll. He'll be interested in that one, You're right? You're a genius. <laughs> You're a genius, Ariel. Uh, I appreciate that, Dan. Congratulations on the win. That was a lot of fun to watch, and it certainly, I think, uh, lived up to the hype, perhaps even uh, exceeded the hype that we all all had for it, the expectations that we had for it. It was a lot of fun, and I'm glad to hear that you're you're feeling okay a couple days later. Thank you for that. Cheers, brother. Good to go. All right, there he is, Dan Hooker, kind enough to join us after headlining his uh, very first show in the UFC in his home country, of New Zealand, and also on that card, a teammate of his, City Kickboxing's Brad Riddell. Last but not least, let's talk to Brad about what he did on Saturday, picking up a big win over Magomed Mustafayev, his second in the UFC, and now uh, developing a bit of a reputation for uh, producing some really exciting, fun fights. There he is. You saw him just bloodied up. Now he's all fresh and clean. Kind enough to join us is Brad Riddell. Brad, how are you? Yeah, good, man. How are you? I'm... Uh doing what Dan looked like by the looks of it. I'm just sitting in the sun, enjoying my day, relaxing. Yeah, man. I'm so jealous of you guys because I know it's uh, summertime over there in New Zealand now. Here, it's uh, far from it in America. So I'm very jealous of these uh, these uh, these scenes behind both of you. But uh, it is well-deserved, and what a great performance, and, and another fun fight. But uh, these fights, man, I mean, these like you've now fought for 30 minutes in the UFC, right? Two 15-minute fights, bloody affairs. Uh, perhaps the next one you want it to go a little smoother, a little quicker than those, or you like those perhaps? Uh, yeah, like I don't mind them. I, uh, it can go wherever it needs to go, but, uh, I nearly had it a little bit earlier than last time. Yeah. Like in that first, that first exchange, I was like, Oh, there we go. That's all I needed. And, uh, unfortunately for me, he sort of bounced into the cage and he was able to, uh, get his head pretty close to me and get an underhook. So I couldn't, uh, posture up and finish him. But I think if I, was back a little bit and managed to do that in the middle of the cage, it would have been over. But uh, it is what it is. He's a tough guy. Is that something in the moment when you when you recognize the fact that, oh, man, if we were in the middle of the cage, this could have been over? Do you harp on that or do you just move on? Oh, for like a split second, I was when I was punching him on like ground and pounding, I was thinking in my head, man, you're lucky. But then, you know, it leaves a second later and got to uh, get on with work. So, yeah, it's all good, man. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, maybe you could have even won the, the fight of the night, but then Dan and Paul kind of blew that one out of the water. <laughs> were you, uh, when you were watching that, you're like, ah, come on, that would have been 50,000 for me. Yeah. I was like, ah, Dan, you asshole, you took my money. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, to be honest, whatever, like that money goes to, uh, to Dan, his family and like their coaches get more. So it's all in all, it's a win-win for our team. Like the fact that all three of us won and then we showed again that Eugene's the and our other coaching staff are the best in the world. That's uh, that's good enough for me. I'll ask you a similar question that that I just asked Dan. Um, you know, you have all this talk of the city kickboxing team, and this is a, an opportunity for you guys to once again prove that you're one of the best gyms in the world. And Izzy kept talking about the the repeat of the three peat. Kai gets the <clears> first <throat> win, and then it's up to you. Like, do you think, all right, I'm the middleman. I I can't be the one to lose on this card. Like, I need to keep this going for Dan. Nah, 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 I don't feel any of that pressure. Um, once Kai won, I was like, yeah, man, like the ball's rolling. Got me excited. Got me, uh, you know, more in the zone. And I just get more and more eager to get in there. If anything, I'm trying to keep myself a bit more relaxed because I get super excited when I'm going to fight. Like, I love it. I always uh, can't wait to get in there. So once Kai got the ball rolling, I was like, oh, yeah, this is our night. Like, it's going to happen again. To fight um, 
in New Zealand is one thing to fight on a UFC card in New Zealand. For you, this is your first time doing it. What was that experience like? It was unreal. Like, I'm super fortunate to be able to have been on that Melbourne card with, uh, you know, both my teammates being the co-main and main event. And then the only thing that could have made it better was going on to a show like this, getting to fight in, in, my, in front of my own crowd at home. Like, I've had two amazing runs in the UFC so far and two great performances. So it was like, uh, yeah, it was a wish come true. And that, that crowd was unreal. Like, you should have felt the energy in there. It was deafening. I'm sure it could have rivaled when Conor McGregor goes to Ireland. Like, you know, our people stand up for us, and uh, it was much appreciated. And so, uh, like, what time approximately would you say the uh, the card was over? Oh, man, it was over at 4 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. I completely forgot. I'm so used to, like, always fighting in the evening, and then we uh, walked outside the stadium, and it was like this. You know, it was yeah. sunny. It was awesome. I was like, damn, man, we can go to the beach if we want. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty cool. So it ends at around 4 o'clock, which is midday, but still, you were just involved in a uh, three-round fight. You're all bloodied up and everything. And then I, I get a, a message on Instagram um, and a video of you up at 5 a.m. teaching <laughs> students uh, in, in yeah. a class. The next day, five, like literally like 12 hours later, here you are. As, uh, one of your students sent this to me. That's really you at 5 a.m. the next day? Yeah, man. I had uh, I had work to do, but uh, it was my... Uh... My IT heavy hitters class, it's a corporate boxing group that raises money for suicide awareness. So, you know, they're all awesome guys. And um, I had to take the week off during fight week to to obviously uh, get in the zone. And that class is pretty early. So I had to, I made a commitment to coach those guys, you know. So I feel like you should turn up and coach them and lead by example. And fortunately enough, I wasn't injured or anything like that. So I was able to do that. So I had no excuse. There wasn't a part of you that wanted to sleep in, maybe like, you know, pick things up in 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 a week or so Nah, i hadn't been to sleep man i slept for like an hour wow not because i was out i was just um just did, i kept going over the fight in my head like i went back to the hotel and slept for about an hour and a half and then i woke straight up and i was wide awake so i was watching tv and my mind was ticking and then i was like ah whatever i'll just stay up so i just stayed up went and taught class i taught two i had one with eugene at five and then i had one by myself after at six <laughs> yeah it was a good way to start the week man and i uh, had the same thing this morning so, oh my gosh uh, yeah every day at five you you teach a class uh just at the moment yeah so while i don't have uh well i'm not too close to a to a fight yeah i do a wimp to warrior with uh, my coach wow. he gets up and he's a monster he, he does two every morning he does 5 a.m 6 a.m he's there till like one o'clock in the afternoon just back to back teaching and and Juggernaut. this particular class you said it's it's for like the working class and how does it connect to suicide awareness? Also, they raise money to for a charity that uh, promotes suicide awareness and helps people that are that are in trouble or in in that state of mind that are really struggling. So we Dan and myself actually do it. Dan trains the red team and I train the blue team. And they meet up in about 12 weeks and they have a corporate boxing fight and raise money. And last year they raised 130 grand. So uh, it's pretty cool. And it's, wow. it's pretty impactful for a lot of people. And uh, yeah, man, like uh, it's a big problem in New Zealand suicide. So a lot of people need help. So yeah. Why do you think it's such a big problem in New Zealand? Oh, uh, man, like I'm not really qualified to, to like drop any stats or talk about it too deeply. But um not sure, man. Like, you know, everyone comes from different back, backgrounds. Everyone has different battles. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be in the position where I've had a, you know, I've never had that problem. And so I feel like it's, you know, like a, a small responsibility of mine to help out people that are struggling because I know I know a fair few that are. And uh, yeah, man. So that's what that's what me and Dan do. And we're showing uh, this this uh, mission that you're trying to put together of bringing some kids yeah. to Thailand. Um, you've set up a GoFundMe page for this. What is this about, and why is this important for you to to bring children to Thailand to go train there? I just uh, well, when I was younger, I was uh, helped out, and I was able to go live over in Thailand and live as a professional fighter. Which uh, about eight six or yeah, about eight years ago, it was really really hard to do that if you're from New Zealand. Um, and I was yeah, I was given like a lot of help, like I said. So I'm just trying to give a bunch of kids that maybe wouldn't have that opportunity, the opportunity to do that and experience what it's like. And hopefully it like, um, gives them the, the bug like I got and they get able to pursue a career like I have. So we're taking, um, 10 kids over there in April 
and it's uh, it's going to be fully funded, and these ten kids are going to have the time of their lives because uh, I'm organising it with the help of my partner and a little, another lady called Victoria. And uh, man, Thailand, I spent four years there, living there, teaching, and it was uh, man, it was a time. That's amazing. Well done. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Cheers, weigh-ins. Uh, you had uh, what? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Part of my ignorance, what appeared to be a, a feather or or some kind of I don't know. You tell me what it is <laughs> painted on your chest. Uh, what kinda, is that? It's a silver fern. So it's like a, one of the national symbols here. It's like a plant. And uh, a lot of uh, teams use that as a representation of New Zealand. So it's like kind of like the Kiwi. You know, it's on that on that level. So I just painted it across my chest because, you know, like that's sort of like my soul was coming out for this for this week. And that was representing that. And, yeah, man, the crowd loved it. Yeah, it was uh, I didn't tell anybody about it. Uh, my partner's friend painted that on me about an hour before the public weigh-in, so I was like, "Ah, oh, this will be a cool surprise for everybody." And yeah, man, got a good reception. Now I, I know that they love you over there and that they were showering you with praise. But to drink the uh, the the beer, you know, you don't know what's in there. That that was a bold move on your part. There was no part of you that thought. You know, maybe this is a little bit, you know, like, who knows what's in there. It could be, I'm a germophobe. So when I saw that, a part of me was like, oh, this could be a potentially hazardous situation. Well, I, yeah, well, I wasn't really thinking that at the time. <laughs> now you say it, I'm like, yeah, okay, it could have had something in it. But uh, no, nah, man, I don't think my people would do that to me. I think they'll just give me straight beer. And yeah. it turns out it was straight beer. It was a little bit hard to stomach right then and there. Uh, but I managed to get it down pretty quick and not uh, dribble too much. So, yeah, if someone offers you a drink like that, at, at, I think at first I was like, oh, nah. But then I was like, oh, nah, I can't turn a beer down from another man here. So yeah. I grabbed it, nicked it, carried on. And down the whole thing in one shot. Very impressive. Is is the shoey a thing in New Zealand as well? Ah, nah, that's Ty's thing, man. That's uh, I'd never heard of a shoey until I met Ty. Uh, over here, we, we we do like a beer. But uh, I haven't been drinking them out of shoes, man. I'm Good. drinking them out of a cup or a bottle. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, I'm in favor of that. If you're going to drink, uh, drinking out of a shoe is a little bit disgusting. Um, and so afterwards, you said Alex Hernandez. And, and I thought that your, your, your reasoning was very interesting. Could, for those that missed it, why, why Alex Hernandez? Yeah, I feel like he's always he's got like a big mouth, man. Like, obviously, stylistically, it's a great matchup. I feel like we're two young guys, both battling our way to the top. And um, I think that'll be a very, very exciting fight because our egos are going to clash and we're going to we're going to go at it. But also, like, I feel like he always is yapping and talking and calls out guys in the sport that are very respected and have earned their place and just says, like, inappropriate things about them and stuff like Cerrone. So, yeah, I, yeah, I'd really like to fight that guy. It's very intriguing to me. And, like, that's a good media matchup, you know, that will generate a lot of uh, a lot of eyes. Yes. So I think uh, all the stars align. Me and him should butt heads. I like it. I like it. Uh, last I checked, he doesn't have a fight that I know of, at least. So uh, let's see if you get that one done. Too, man. Um, and so now I would imagine the attention turns to March 7th in Las Vegas. Israel Desanya, your teammate, fighting against Joe Romero, defending his title. Will you be going to Las Vegas as well? Uh, at the moment, no. You know, it could be a last minute thing. I never know. Uh, but. I might stay here. You know, I didn't get my Christmas or much of my summer, so I'm going to stay here and I think spend some time here. But support Izzy all the same. Um, and that guy looks dangerous as always. He looks scary. Yo, I was in for a hell of a time. You know, <laughs> obviously I'm biased, but man, that guy's uh, he's another level. So Izzy's uh, yeah, he's looking good, man. You guys should look forward to that fight. And I know that you are a very important part of what uh, Alex Volkanovsky has done. And congratulations to you on on helping to turn him into the champion that he's become. Uh, do you think that we'll see him in June defending his title? I'm sure you will. You'll definitely see him in June. Uh, I'm a small part of what he's become. Uh, Joe uh, Lopez is the biggest part. You know, that guy's an amazing coach. He took a small, overweight Australian and made him into a, you know, a UFC champion, which is a very, very impressive. And a very, very small gym in a, in a little town. So that is a crazy, crazy achievement. And uh, Eugene and I just came in at the end and... Uh, I'm just more of a training partner, man. Like he, he likes the hard push. He's a grinder, and I love that grind too. So we get along pretty well. But uh, you're definitely gonna see him in June, and it's gonna, like always, man. He's gonna come out there and retain that belt. Are you, uh, are you voting for the the Holloway rematch, or would you like to see him fight someone new? 
I uh, will personally, I would like to see him fight someone new before fighting Max straight away. I'm not saying Max doesn't deserve it. You know, he was such a dominant champion and he's achieved so much. Of course, he uh, deserves a rematch, you know. But uh, I think straight away, it would have been cool to fight someone else, you know. Uh, obviously, all the diehard Max Holloway fans want him to fight straight away and get that belt back. But uh, I think we should fight someone else and then maybe fight Max, you know. Like who? Just, uh, I don't know, man. I'd have to let Alex choose. It's not really my place to say. All right. But, um, yeah, it's, it's up to him and his, uh, his boss. <laughs> I feel you on that. Well, um, congratulations on another great performance. Very impressive stuff. And uh, even, Thank you know, Ariel. I know that you say that it's just kind of something that you agree to, but you don't see a lot of fighters showing up uh, the following morning to, to help teach you know just regular folk um so well done on that as well and everything that you're doing with those kids trying to bring them to uh, thailand pleasure as always to have you brad once again on the program enjoy the victory and we'll talk to you soon pleasure is mine i'll talk to you soon again see ya all right there he is brad riddell with a big win on saturday and once again another big night for city see, kickboxing three and oh on saturday sunday technically in New Zealand, uh, Kai Kara France, Brad Riddell, and of course Dan Hooker in the main event. Speaking of Alex Volkanovsky, very quickly here, uh, Mark Ramundi of ESPN reporting earlier today and first reported by MMA Junkie, I do believe, that Chan Sung Jung, uh, you may recall, was on the show a couple of weeks ago talking about that eye appointment that he had uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago. He was about to get an eye, uh, a second opinion on his, uh, his eye that was bothering him. Well, it appears as though he has now opted for eye surgery and is planning a return to the octagon in the summer per his manager, Jason House. So uh, that might rule him out of the potential fight against Alex Volkanovsky. I still maintain that Max Holloway is the front runner for that one and probably why we haven't seen Max Holloway openly campaign or get involved in all this back and forth because he probably knows that he is getting that fight. Will it be in uh, Australia? Most likely at this point, especially with uh, Volkanovsky, according to Brad, um, looking like he's good to go. I know Big Guns, uh, Phil Murphy, spoke to him last week in New Zealand. Uh, it looks like it could be a... Uh, a uh, double title uh, title fight card with uh, Volkanovski defending against uh, Holloway. And then, of course, the fight that was announced last week, uh, Valentina Shevchenko against Joanne Calderwood. That would be the co-main event. So stay tuned for that. For now, though, it appears as though, based on the fact that they are playing my music, we are out of time. Fun day here on the program. I really would love to talk a little more to Eddie Hearn. I really enjoyed that. I love the, the art of fight promotion. I love that. And... Uh, I, I like the way he does his business. I like the way he speaks with the passion and the knowledge that he has. I really enjoyed that conversation. So one of these days we'll have him back on, perhaps on the Wednesday pod. Did you hear our Wednesday pod last week with uh, Diego Sanchez's guru, Josh Fabia? If you haven't, I do suggest you check it out. It was an enlightening conversation. And uh, Josh has texted me many a times afterwards, which is a nice byproduct of said conversation. In any event, for now, we are out of time. Thank you very much to George Lockhart and congrats to him and the team on Tyson Fury's victory on Saturday. Thank you very much to Eddie Hearn. Thank you to Stephen Adams. That was a great conversation. Great to talk to him. Thank you and all the best to Joanna Janjacek. Good luck to her on March 7th. Thank you very much to Joanne Calderwood. Good luck to her coming up in June. Thank you very much to Ryan Hall. Good luck to him in trying to get that fight. Thank you very much to James Gallagher. Thank you very much to Jimmy Crute. Thank you very much to Dan hooker and thank you very much and congratulations to brad riddell back next week same time and place until then i say peace i'm out of here this was the biggest camp that i've ever been a part of and when i say the biggest camp i mean the size of them i mean i'm 230 pounds in his camp i was a munchkin i was like a man baby walking around what's the beef between you and tyson i think uh, a lot of it is is uh, play talk from tyson fury he's actually blocked me on twitter Man, I, if I could hold another UFC record, that'd be great. Seeing old Uncle Dana yeah. walking past. <laughs> hey, mate. If you land like a good punch or land like a good kick, you'll see like a, a slight grimace or, or you'll see something. Like the guy will the guy will show a little something, something, but um, I'll pull further, not, not once, you know. And we've seen the damage that we inflicted on each other, so it's... He's, he's a good poker player. True or false, will Antonio Brown fight in a boxing match promoted by you this year? I want to try and make that fight, yes. So you're going to see a yes from me. I almost ripped the tooth out of my head actually eating a taco, believe it or not. What? I guess in, uh, yeah, I didn't know you could do that. Colby should be more respectful 
uh, to his teammates and and women, you know, in general, you know. He should learn how to say hi, sorry, I apologize. I mean, the relationship there is more, I have to respect him as an elder. You know, it ain't so much like, oh, Adesanya is my boy. It's like, oh, you know, thank you. What was your reaction when you got the call that it's actually happening? I done some laps on my around my living room and was screaming and just I was very excited. The randoms that just got to the UFC that have had a fight, they can buzz off. You know, you fry fish. You don't you don't fry brisket. Four <laughs> fouders, four fouders brisket. You got a slow cook. Perhaps when this is all said and done, you can transition over. You got the size, you got the reach. Why not? You got the power. No way. I'm heavyweight. I have to go up against like Derek Lewis or something. That's scary, mate. There's no chance.